It's a showdown that's been brewing for years, and 2022 is increasingly looking like the year that the war everyone has feared will finally happen, the United States versus Iran. How do the two sides stack up to each other, and how would a war between the two play out? Iran is ranked in 14th place amongst the world's top militaries, not bad for a nation that's been under severe sanctions for years, but today it's facing off against the world's number one ranked military and only global superpower, the United States of America. A conflict between Iran and the US is unlikely to become severe enough to cause a need for the US to fully mobilize its population, though Iran might certainly need to. However, more population means a bigger economy and more capabilities, and here the United States takes the cake, with a population of 335 million versus Iran's 86 million. That's a difference of 249 million more Americans than Iranians. Of that population, though, the US could call on 147 million for potential military service, though only 122 million of them are physically or mentally fit enough to actually serve. Iran, on the other hand, has a manpower pool of 48 million, with only 40 million actually fit for service. If a war between Iran and the US were to turn into a multi-year stalemate, it would be important to quickly replenish losses. And here too, the United States holds the advantage, with 4.3 million teenagers reaching military age annually, versus Iran's 1.3 million. Currently, though, on active duty, the United States has the world's third largest military, with a 1.39 million strong military versus Iran's 575,000. Reserves are important for replenishing casualties and rotating out exhausted troops to give them a chance to recoup and recover, and both countries are pretty evenly matched there, with the US having a reservist force of 442,000 versus Iran's 350,000. Iran enjoys such large amounts of reservists thanks to the fact that its military service is compulsory for all males upon reaching adulthood. This means that the Iran the Iranian active duty military is largely made up of conscripts, with few professional volunteer soldiers. These conscripts are typically drafted at age 19 and made to serve two years, though few receive much useful military training during that time. Most Iranian soldiers rarely ever fire their weapons and have to work with equipment that's mostly from the first half of the Cold War. This is in sharp contrast with the US military, which maintains an aggressive year-round training cycle. Training is frequently punctuated with small-scale exercises and occasionally with larger multi-unit exercises. The US Navy's RIMPAC exercise, for example, is a massive event that takes place every two years and involves the military forces of over two dozen partner nations across the Pacific Rim. Not only do conscripts traditionally perform very poorly against professional all-volunteer forces, but Iran's conscripts undergo very little useful training and would be completely overwhelmed against America's professionally trained warfighters. A military is only as good as the equipment it can afford, and war is a costly affair. Iran has an annual budget of $5 billion for its military, though the nation spends significant amounts of money under the table carrying out various military-related activities in its sphere of influence. By comparison, the United States has a defense budget of $770 billion, absolutely dwarfing what Iran spends annually. In the realm of military hardware, Iran fields an air force of 543 planes versus the US's 13,247. Of these, on Iran's side, 197 are fighter aircraft, while the US maintains a fighter fleet of 1,957. If Iran and the US were to come to blows, the US might find itself surprised to be taking on one of its own most capable fighters ever built during the Cold War. That's because Iran is still fielding the F-14 Tomcat, having an estimated 40 of them still in service. This is thanks to a pre-revolution deal with the Iranian government that saw them buy 80 of the planes, though only 79 were delivered. After the revolution, the United States shut down all support for Iran's Tomcat fleet, and it feared having to go up against the formidable fighter so much that it actually destroyed every single Tomcat it retired to prevent Iran from having any opportunity of seizing badly needed parts for maintenance. Without US support for parts replacement, its Tomcat fleet has been steadily shrinking as planes are cannibalized to keep others flying. Today it's believed between 40 to 43 of them are still mission capable, with 20 fully mission capable and 20 only partially mission capable. The rest of Iran's air fleet is made up of Cold War era MiG-29s, American F-4 Phantom IIs and F-5 Tiger II, Chinese J-7s, Mirage F-1s, Su-22s and domestically made at HESA Kosar and HESA Saike. The latter are only available in very low numbers and are both light attack jets, widely considered to be very inefficient machines. In a ground attack role, Iran is forced to use multi-role planes such as the Su-22 and domestically modified F-5E, known as the HESA Azarash. Both planes are only suited for small-scale strike missions and with a lack of targeting pods are incapable of precision strikes. Iran's fighter fleet is largely non-modern, though some of their planes have received fourth-generation avionics. However, so many different aircraft models are a nightmare to conduct maintenance on, so it's unlikely many of these planes are actually operationally ready, and even less likely they would remain 
remain so during high-tempo combat operations. Such a diverse and mixed air fleet drives up both maintenance costs and time, and can make sourcing replacement parts a nightmare. By comparison, though, the United States fields the world's most modern air fleet, though some of the planes are showing a growing lack of modernity. The F-15 Eagle and F-16 Fighting Falcon are both extremely capable fighter aircraft, capable of both air superiority and ground attack, but are showing their age against increasingly sophisticated modern fighters and air defenses. America's F-22 remains the single deadliest airplane in the sky, with significant capability overmatch against any other fighter aircraft in the world. However, it's also one of the most expensive aircraft in the world, forcing the US Air Force to limit its production run to just under 200. Today, 195 remain in service, and no further Raptors will ever be built. Instead, the US Air Force is already looking ahead to a sixth-generation fighter for air superiority with a prototype already tested and flown. In the meantime, it relies on its fleet of F-15s and F-35s for the air superiority mission, with 283 fifth-generation F-35s across all arms of the US military. This number grows every year, with a planned purchase of 1,763 F-35s for just the US Air Force alone. Lockheed Martin is set to provide the US military with approximately 135 planes per year until the contract is completed, making US Air Forces deadlier with every passing year. The US Navy and Marines, meanwhile, operate the vaunted F-18 Super Hornet, which replaced the F-14 Tomcat in 1985. One of the most agile jets on the planet, it's light enough to be launched from carriers but capable of bringing large weapons packages to the fight, making it perfect as a multi-role fighter. To support ground troops, though, the US Air Force relies on the A-10 Thunderbolt II, an impressive ground attack aircraft that has achieved legendary status since its introduction in 1977. Strategic bombing is carried out by a mixed fleet of B-52 Stratofortresses, B-2 Spirits, and B-1B Lancers. The B-52 was put into service first in 1955 and incredibly is set to remain in service until the 2050s, making it the longest service aircraft in history. Thanks to aggressive upgrades, the plane remains one of the deadliest bombers in the sky and proved itself against the Soviet defenses during the Vietnam War thanks to its aggressive suite of electronic warfare countermeasures. The American B-2 fleet was originally designed to slip behind enemy lines and deliver strategic nuclear strikes and remains the world's only stealth bomber. An upgrade after the fall of the Soviet Union saw it geared for more conventional combat and now is tasked with slipping through the densest enemy air defenses and eliminating high-value targets. The B-1B Lancer is a much faster strategic bomber that has less endurance than the B-52 but can fly at supersonic speeds to deliver bombs quickly where they're needed the most. America's overwhelming advantage in attack aircraft places Iranian ground forces at serious risk. Unlike powers like China and Russia, US aircraft are largely multi-role capable and its pilots trained in both air superiority and ground attack missions. This gives the United States a significant advantage over any competitor, and an edge that only makes a war an increasingly bad proposition for Iran. To fend off the mighty US Air Force, Iran relies not on air superiority fighters, but on a robust layer of ground-based air defenses. At the outermost layer are Iran's longest range air defenses, the Bavar 373, which is a reverse-engineered Russian S-300. It also has a few S-300 batteries courtesy of Russia who delivered them in 2015 after Iran joined the JCPOA nuclear deal. With a range of 155 miles, these present a significant threat to fourth-generation aircraft, but F-35s equipped with glide bombs or even B-52s using standoff attack munitions could easily overwhelm and destroy these batteries on their radar. At intermediate range, Iran fields an update on a reverse-engineered American SM-1 missile sold to the Iranian Navy prior to the revolution. The 1960s tech has been updated with domestic upgrades, producing the Sayyad 2, which boasts a range of 46 miles, though the longer Sayyad 3 has a range of 75 miles. These missiles can be difficult to destroy on the ground because they can be mounted on very agile truck-mounted launchers, which can rapidly reposition. For short to intermediate range engagements, Iran has the Salimcha missiles, produced from reverse-engineered American Hawk missiles provided to Iran in the 1960s. Iran also has a new triple rail launcher system called Mersad and has the ability to engage up to two targets simultaneously. Various other foreign source SAM systems have been cloned or reverse engineered by Iran, and the nation fields a sizable quantity of low altitude defense systems meant to be used against helicopters. However dense Iranian air defenses are, most of them are static and well known to the US. By using a combination of stealth aircraft, standoff attack munitions, and electronic jamming, the US with its overwhelming air fleet could easily dismantle the Iranian air defense system, just like the US did with zero or minimal losses in Iraq, Libya, and Syria. To support its ground forces, Iran has nothing more than a token attack helicopter fleet, which would not survive initial contact against US forces equipped with short-range air defenses and man pads. The US, on the other hand, has the world's 
largest attack helicopter fleet, made up of 910 helicopters, including the Apache and Super Cobra, used by the American Marine Corps. These attack helicopters are both heavily armored and can provide flexible close air support, as well as engage in reconnaissance and hunter-killer missions. The Apache in particular is an incredibly robust aircraft, with only a single Apache lost to heavy anti-aircraft fire during an ambush by Iraq's military at Najaf. However, the 32 Apaches were forced to retreat and unable to carry out their deep attack mission behind enemy lines, which is their primary purpose. This has prompted the need by the US Army to replace its aging Apaches with more capable variants who can survive modern combat. In a conflict between Iran and the US, tanks will largely be the dominant weapon of choice thanks to a largely flat, open terrain of the country. Iran brings 2,831 tanks to fight, while the United States has the world's second largest fleet at 6,612. Iran's tanks, however, are mostly Cold War relics, though it does field capable T-72s upgraded with modern armor, sensor, and cannons. However, Iran's tanks are largely considered to be inferior to any Western model, let alone the vaunted American Abrams. An effort to build a next-generation domestic tank failed in the late 2010s and was likely just a big publicity ploy to get Russia to lower its asking price for supplying the country with tanks. The Zulfikar series of domestically made tanks suffer from weapons embargoes, leaving Iran incapable of equipping them with truly modern systems. The United States' own Abrams have been continuously upgraded since their introduction to the US armed forces. Currently, the Abrams tank fleet is being upgraded to System Enhancement Program version 4, which finally brings a third-generation thermal imager to the Abrams tank, a key weakness plaguing American tanks for years. Trophy anti-missile defense systems have also started to be integrated into American tanks, using radar and explosive charges to defeat enemy anti-tank missiles. To see why this has become so critically important, one only need to look at the performance of Russian armor in Ukraine today, with Ukraine forces killing hundreds of modern Russian tanks with anti-tank missiles. With each upgrade, though, the Abrams tank is becoming heavier and heavier, a serious problem for the tank fleet as it's now feared the tank might be too heavy to cross some bridges. Greater weight also means more fuel expenditure, lowering its already short combat range between 93 and 124 miles in cross-country conditions. However, American Abrams would prove absolutely lethal to Iran's own tank fleets, and their improved protection against RPGs and IEDs means that they'll even be more survivable in urban environments, where most of the fighting will likely end up taking place. Armored personnel carriers are important for helping support one's infantry and protecting them in a deadly modern battlefield. The United States can boast total mechanized capabilities for its infantry, while Iran struggles to do the same. The US fields a fleet of over 45,000 armored vehicles versus Iran's 7,600. Again, Iran's armored vehicles are early Russian or late Soviet models and severely lacking in modernity upgrades thanks to budget limitations and sanctions. American Bradleys, meanwhile, are capable of engaging other lightly armored vehicles and even taking out tanks thanks to two anti-tank missiles on each vehicle. Both Iran and the US have comparable amounts of artillery, with the US fielding 1,498 self-propelled artillery and 1,339 towed artillery such as howitzers. Iran, meanwhile, has 1,030 self-propelled artillery and 2,108 towed artillery pieces. The similarity in capabilities here is because the United States traditionally relies on much more flexible and accurate air assets for fire support, even though its artillery corps are significantly more capable than Iran's own thanks to the use of smart munitions. New guided projectiles have actually earned American artillery a world record for distance, firing a shell 43 miles and hitting a practice target with pinpoint accuracy. However, even Iran's dumb artillery is a significant threat to both vehicles and personnel, and the large numbers of artillery available to Iran should not be ignored in a potential conflict scenario. Of course, thanks to air dominance, Iranian artillery batteries would be decidedly non-survivable assets in combat. Multiple rocket projectors or rocket artillery can be devastating when used against infantry. By firing significant numbers of rockets in short succession, MLRS rocket systems deny infantry a chance to get to cover the way tube artillery and its far slower rate of fire does. The US employs 1,366 MLRS, while Iran has 2,485, again mostly Russian or Soviet-made. For all the incompetence of Russia's modern military forces, the Ukrainian conflict shows that even basic MLRS systems are devastating when used in large numbers. This too is a threat that shouldn't be discarded, but unlikely to be very survivable against the US's air fleets. Naval operations will be an important part of a war between Iran and the US. At sea, the US fields navy made up of 484 vessels versus Iran's 142. However, most of Iran's navy is made up of smaller patrol boats. The US meanwhile operates 11 supercarriers, each carrying four squadrons of attack aircraft and various special mission aircraft such as tankers, electronic warfare platforms, and airborne radar. The US also has a fleet of nine smaller carriers meant to support amphibious operations, equipped with helicopters and the US Marines variant of the F-35 capable of vertical landing. 
Under the waves, the U.S. has a fleet of 68 submarines, with the new Virginia-class submarines replacing Cold War-era Los Angeles-class subs. American submarines aren't just deadly to Iran's navy, but can even use cruise missiles to attack land targets deep inside Iranian territory. Long holding the advantage in underwater tech, American subs are notoriously stealthy and difficult to track. Iran, meanwhile, has a fleet of 19 subs, though most of these are midget submarines. These small submarines are primarily meant to attack shipping inside the Persian Gulf and Gulf of Oman, with Iran's stated goal of being to block traffic of large oil-laden ships in case of war with the U.S. This would have a devastating effect on global gas prices, and it's the U.S.'s top priority to locate and destroy these tiny submarines before they can succeed in their mission. The rest of the Iranian submarine fleet consists of three Soviet-era Kilo-class and one Iranian Fateh-class submarine though the latter is not well suited for deep water operations. Again, largely lacking in modernity, the fact that these are diesel electric submarines means there could still be a significant threat to unwary U.S. assets. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S. Navy allowed its once prolific anti-submarine warfare capabilities to seriously atrophy, leading to a series of embarrassing exercises with friendly nation submarines in the early 2000s. However, since then, any hostilities seem more likely with China, and the U.S. has beefed up its ASW capabilities once more, even adopting fleets of drones to aid in the task of hunting down and tracking enemy subs. Killing a major American ship with an older and less technologically advanced sub is not impossible for Iran, but very difficult and extremely unlikely to happen more than once. Iran's surface fleet has only about nine major combatants in the form of corvettes and frigates, the rest being fast attack boats and patrol boats. Iran's surface combatants would face 92 American destroyers and 22 corvettes, though likely it would be carrier-based aircraft who would destroy Iran's surface fleet before it can take much action against American ships. However, smaller patrol and torpedo boats could prove more difficult to target, and if employed in swarm tactics, could end up at least causing significant damage to large U.S. ships. The advantage is clearly on the U.S. side in almost every single category, with U.S. forces fielding far more capable equipment and having better trained troops. So, how would a war with Iran play out? A real war would be unlikely to include ground forces, as the U.S. would be very reluctant to get dragged into yet a third ground war in the Middle East. However, if removal of the regime was necessary for some reason, the U.S. would have to commit ground forces in the effort. First, American carrier-based aircraft supported by the Air Force strike aircraft flying from nearby friendly airfields in Saudi Arabia would launch a massive air assault against the nation. No doubt, Iran would immediately or even preemptively launch a large ballistic missile attack against these airfields and even U.S. vessels, but thanks to robust air defenses and the assistance of Saudi defenses, few of these missiles would cause significant damage. Iran has proven in multiple missile attacks against Israeli targets that its targeting capabilities are spotty at best, further reducing the threat posed by ballistic missiles. American Wild Weasel aircraft would first engage enemy air defenses, destroying either missile platforms themselves or their supporting radar. More mobile, shorter-range air defenses might threaten some U.S. aircraft, but it's unlikely that Iran would down a significant amount of U.S. planes. Traditionally, the U.S. is extremely good at neutral neutralizing air defense networks, and while some air defenses may be mobile, their radars rarely ever are. Without radar, most air defense assets are practically useless. Iran could rely on actual anti-air artillery left over from the Cold War, but with U.S. planes flying so high, this is unlikely to achieve any results. Next, American planes would pummel missile sites, command and control nodes, logistics hubs, and even troop barracks, bringing devastation across the country from the air. Strikes would also take place against port facilities and major surface warships, while under the waves, U.S. attack submarines and cooperation with ASW aircraft work to pinpoint Iran's submarine fleet and neutralize it. However, even an overwhelming aerial campaign would be insufficient to bring Iran to heel. For that, the Americans would have to commit to a ground war. Invading through Iraq would be difficult, as it would mean passing through thick swamps that favor the defender and then running straight into the Zagros Mountains. Going in through Turkey would be incredibly unlikely. Turkey did not allow the U.S. to use it as a staging base for Iraq's invasion, and relations between the U.S. and Turkey have significantly soured since then. Going through Afghanistan in the east would mean traversing two deserts, which would put U.S. forces far from any strategically important targets. It's likely then that an amphibious assault would be necessary, and while the U.S. Navy and Marines are up to the task, amphibious assaults can be costly, dangerous affairs. However, once in-country with a beachhead established, even with superior capabilities, actually defeating Iran would be difficult for the U.S. That's thanks to the sheer size of the country, which is larger than several European countries combined. A study in the late 2000s showed that the U.S. would need about 1.6 million troops to successfully occupy the entire country, meaning the U.S. would either have to initiate conscription or draw in partners for the invasion, something it might actually be able to do given tensions in the Middle East between Iran and many of its neighbors. If the invasion was reasonable
reasonably justified, the US could likely count on international support anyway. In all likelihood, Iran would try to make the US bleed as much as possible with its conventional forces, but seek to defeat it through asymmetrical means like those employed in Afghanistan. Intelligence shows that today Iran is attempting to infiltrate a network of agents into the US to target political figures such as former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who is now under guard 24-7. By turning to terrorist group allies, Iran could turn America's invasion into a second Afghanistan, and the US public has little stomach for yet another two-decade war. However, the US might be able to count on the Iranian people themselves to help them overthrow the current regime, especially if it keeps civilian casualties to a minimum. Many people in Iran are tired of living under sanctions and under the thumb of an oppressive Tehran regime, and it's likely that the US would be welcomed as liberators across much of Iran. In this regard, Iran is different from either Iraq or Afghanistan, and a lack of popular support could hinder Iran's ability to launch a successful asymmetrical campaign against US forces. As we write this, you don't have to look far to find headlines in the media containing the words US and Iran and conflict. The BBC writes that the USA has sent over 1,000 troops to the Middle East because according to the American Acting Defense Secretary, Patrick Shanahan, Iran has been acting hostile. Iran has been accused of oil tanker attacks, and the country, it said, will also soon breach a 2015 deal regarding its uranium stockpiles. The New York Times has called this a new confrontation with the West. How bad could this get? What kind of a threat would Iran be? Is there really a threat at all when compared to the might of the US military? Let's have a look. If you watched many of our other military comparison shows, then you're likely already an expert when it comes to the arsenal of the US military. You'll know that the US spends more on defense than any other country by a long, long way. Sources differ, and it's hard to get the exact spending down to the last dollar, but in 2018 it's reported that the USA's defense budget was somewhere between $587 billion and $597 billion. But if you go to the actual US Department of Defense website, one of the first things you'll read is that President Trump plans to pump an extra $160 billion into defense. The prediction from the DoD right from the horse's mouth is that by the end of 2019, defense spending will have reached $686 billion. Where does all this cash go? Well, the DoD website just breaks it down into simply various departments – the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Joint Chiefs. If you're wondering what the Joint Chiefs are, well, they kind of run the show. Part of their mission statement reads, The future operating environment will place new demands on leaders at all levels. Our leaders must have the training, education, and experience to meet those demands. It's not all about spending money on killer toys, of course, because you have a lot of paychecks at the end of the week. The US military has 2,083,100 personnel. 1,281,900 work as active personnel, and 801,200 reservists. On top of that, you have all kinds of special units and specialists to pay. It's not free when the US, say, wants to buy artificial intelligence technology to scan faces, go through hours of drone videos, etc. Research and development, according to the US military, eats up a great deal of money. Thankfully, someone else has broken down the budget for us, and it goes like this. A little over $205 billion goes to the Navy, and the Air Force will basically get the same at $204.8 billion. $191.4 billion will go to the Army, and $116.6 billion will go to projects spread across the DoD. $104.3 billion will go to research, development, test, and evaluation. $143.1 billion will go to buying new things, such as expensive aircraft and ships. $155.8 billion will actually go to the actual men and women of the military through the paycheck budget. $22.5 billion will go to building houses for personnel and other military construction projects. $292.7 billion, the biggest part of the budget, is for maintaining the military. If you add all this up, though, it comes to more than the actual budget. That's because some of the spending overlaps, such as research, purchases, or wages, that might need to be accounted for as part of the individual forces' budgets. If you look at what the military has been buying or trying to buy, you'll see that the F-35 Joint Strike Fighters are a big item on the shopping list. These things also get sold, of course, but as we write this, Japan, according to some reports, is no longer looking at buying many more of them because it has created its own aircraft that it sees as superior. Nonetheless, if you follow military news, you'll know that these things are still selling like hotcakes. The US currently has around 200, plans to build a staggering 1,763 more. As we've said before, the US no doubt has the most powerful air force in the world, and we just cannot list everything that's in its arsenal of flying machines. But some of the most powerful beasts include the fleets of F-22 Raptors, F-15E Strike Eagles, F-A-18EF Super Hornets, and F-16 Fighting Falcons. 
Some of the newer machines are 15 KC-46 tanker strategic military transport aircrafts and also the B-21 stealth bomber. So can Iran afford to spend billions and billions of dollars on just one plane alone? Well, the answer is a resounding no, and in fact, recent news reports tell us that the country has slashed defense spending to the equivalent of $43 billion. Compare this to reports in 2019 that the US Navy just paid Virginia shipbuilder Huntington Ingalls $15 billion to start construction on the new Ford-class aircraft carriers. Also bear in mind the billion spent on new aircraft or the two fleet replenishment oilers at $1.1 billion. The 5,113 joint light tactical vehicles costing $2 billion or the M1 Abrams tank modification setting the US back $2.7 billion. Just one new Columbia-class submarine will cost $3.7 billion, and the military has requested $6 billion for some DDG-51 Arleigh Burke-class destroyers. The list goes on and on, and we cannot possibly tell you everything on that shopping list. But all in all, you have over 2 million personnel, around 13,400 military planes and counting, including about 5,700 helicopters, add to that 6,287 tanks for land-based operations, then on water you have a total of 20 aircraft carriers which are like traveling army, and would be very important when fighting a country located on the other side of the globe, the USA also has 68 destroyers and 68 submarines, but as you know, more of both are in the pipeline. As you can see, this is shaping up to be a David and Goliath story. No one doubts that in terms of equipment the USA has by far the biggest and arguably most advanced military in the world. We say arguably because countries such as China, Japan, the UK, India, France, Russia also have some very capable military toys. Iran though, well, you won't find the country on the top 10 lists when it comes to military might, and some writers have described Iran's equipment as being Cold War era machines. In total, Iran has 523,000 active military personnel, but also around 350,000 reservists. They own 509 military aircraft, which sounds fairly impressive, but let's see what kind of planes these are. For starters, they have 54 American-made McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom IIs. Some of these are pretty old, but we are told many have been upgraded. Joining the list are also some other capable multi-role aircraft, such as 23 French-made Dassault Mirage F-1s. As for ground attack, Iran has about 50 Russian-made planes and the Sukhoi Su range, the Su-22, Su-24, and 25. Iran is also in the process of building a fifth-generation stealth fighter aircraft called the IAIO Kher 313. Although some experts have cast doubts as to how viable this aircraft will be, this is not a weak air force by any means, but much of that strength comes from purchased American military hardware. That said, much of this fleet is aging and in need of an upgrade whereas the American military has never stopped upgrading their equipment, whether they need it or not, as any American taxpayer can tell you. As for tanks, Iran has 1,634 of them, but we might ask just how advanced these tanks are. Well, again, the country owns quite a few older models bought from the USA, Russia, and has also some homemade tanks. But in 2018, Iran's Deputy Defense Minister Reza announced that the country was in the process of building another 700 to 800 new tanks. The country also has 2,345 armored fighting vehicles, but compare that to the 39,223 armored fighting vehicles in the USA, which for the most part are much more modern. But where Iran is really weak is in the water, as it doesn't have a single aircraft carrier to speak of. Remember, the US has 20, the country has no destroyers either, but does have a 34-strong submarine fleet and 6 frigates. While Iran really is an underdog to the US military, that doesn't mean it isn't a strong military. Ranking militaries is difficult and shouldn't be taken as an exact science. Iran has had to be a strong military presence before, and it has a large, well-trained military because of its location in a volatile region. Reporting has stated that they have a ground force that includes over 1,600 tanks, 725 reconnaissance and infantry fighting vehicles, 640 armored personnel carriers, 2,322 towed and self-propelled howitzers, and 1,476 multiple rocket launchers. Yes, the numbers can change since we guess the press doesn't have a regular tank counter working all over the world, but we're guessing these numbers are pretty close to reality. Much like their air fleet though, much of this equipment is somewhat outdated and likely needing of either upgrading or a full replacement. Now we already know that the USA has some of the most advanced special forces units in the world and also is not bad at collecting intelligence through the CIA, NIS and both of their cutting edge computer technologies. But the Iranian forces have also a special branch that is said to be very highly trained and is an entity to be feared, the Quds Force. 
a special ops unit within Iran's Revolutionary Guards. They number around 15 to 30,000 very skilled agents and work in what you might call unconventional warfare. Iran also has the advantage in the event of an invasion of being a geographically difficult country to assault via land. It's a large country and the major cities are mostly located in areas that would be difficult for land forces to quickly reach. And now we come back to the start. What about these new fears of nuclear conflict? The New York Times writes this, Iran is still well more than a year away from being able to build a weapon, perhaps much longer. But the experts in the article also said it would take much longer to produce what the Times called a deliverable weapon. It's highly unlikely Iran is thinking about attacking the USA. And many European countries have blamed the US for putting Iran in a difficult position thanks to harsh sanctions. We won't get into the politics, but suffice to say, confrontation of military powers with nuclear weapons is not something anyone wants. As Newsweek points out, while the US military is by far superior in every way, an invasion would be a long drawn out affair. They wrote, if decades of difficult conflicts worldwide have taught the American military anything, it's that a mighty armory goes only so far. Let's hope for some diplomacy that works for both nations and the threat of a conflict behind us. The year is 1976. An Iranian F-4 Phantom fighter jet engages an unidentified flying object. The UFO is projecting multicolored strobe lights when suddenly it releases an object that shoots toward the Iranian pilots. The pilot gets a lock on the object, but before it can be destroyed, the plane's weapons and communication systems go down. The pilot takes immediate evasive actions. Fast forward to the 2000s, Iranian F-14 Tomcats engage another UFO. This time there are casualties. The UFO evades the fighter jets and flies out of the atmosphere at Mach 10. It would seem that Iran and UFOs have an interesting history together. When you hear stories of unidentified flying objects, you may imagine a flying saucer or little green aliens. Not only that, but the person who's giving the account seems to always be someone who's not quite all there. They tend to have their crazy hair and wild eyes, but the UFO accounts from Iran are detailed and provided by respected military personnel. The information comes from the eyewitness witness accounts and classified documents that have been leaked to the public. The first contact between a UFO and the Iranian military occurred in 1976 above the city of Tehran. It was a cool desert night. There were no clouds in the sky. The Milky Way stretched across the heavens like an oasis in a black desert. The sound of shopkeepers closing up their stalls for the night filled the air. Then suddenly, the skies over Tehran lit up. It was just after midnight on September 19th. Tehran residents began telephoning the local airport frantically relaying the same message. They were seeing bright lights in the sky. The lights seemed to hover in place and then move rapidly to a different location. It was as if the lights were looking for something, or someone. The military and airport personnel checked the radar, but nothing showed up. General Yousefi, the man in charge of the airfield, stepped outside and looked up at the sky. Sure enough, he saw the bright lights for himself. He witnessed the lights jetting across the sky. They looked like shooting stars being controlled by some unseen entity. He scrambled back into the airport and found his best pilots to investigate further. General Yousefi ordered Lieutenant Yadi Nazari and a backseat weapons officer to take off and have a look at the object in the sky. It was time to get up close and personal. The F-4 Phantom fighter plane took off at 1.30 a.m and leveled off at the altitude of the unidentified object. Upon approach, the F-4 lost all navigational instruments and communications. The dials and screens in the aircraft went haywire. Nazari was flying only using his instincts and what he could see. He kept his eyes on the UFO and his aircraft pointed at the horizon. Nazari made the decision it was too dangerous to continue this way and was forced to turn around and return to base. As soon as the plane began moving away from the UFO, the instruments came back online. It was as if the UFO had some sort of electronics jammer. A second F-4 Phantom was launched at 1.40 a.m., piloted by Lieutenant Parvez Jafari. He approached the UFO and acquired a radar lock. This meant that there was definitely something tangible in the sky. The UFO was a solid mass that reflected the radar and therefore couldn't have been ball lightning or any form of pure energy. Upon getting closer to the UFO, Jafari reported that its lights were alternating in color from blue, green, red, and orange. They were strobing so quickly that they almost appeared to be solid. The UFO began to move south and Jafari pursued the vessel. All of a sudden, the UFO stopped in mid-air. It just sat there unmoving, as if the law of gravity was a force that it could choose to obey or not. Jafari veered around and stopped the aircraft so he wouldn't collide with it. He turned his jet back around and headed back toward the unidentified vessel at a slower speed. On the return approach by Jafari, something even stranger happened. The UFO dropped a bright object out from its main hull. 
Jafari reported that the object was headed straight for him and his F-4 Phantom, and it looked like a torpedo made of light. He attempted to lock onto the incoming projectile with his AIM-9 Sidewander infrared guided missiles, but just after getting a lock, he lost all communications with his weapons console. Jafari was forced to take evasive actions and turn away from the projectile. He jammed the flight stick to the side. The F-4 did a barrel roll and avoided the incoming object. Jafari leveled off again, and when he turned back to look for the object shot at him, Jafari said he saw the device reverse course and rejoin the main UFO. It then seemed to dock with the mothership. Jafari then witnessed another bright object coming out of the main UFO and descending straight down toward the ground. It left a bright trail of light as it descended. The ambient light lit up an area of around 3 kilometers. Then, as if it were done with its business, it came to Iran to conduct. The UFO accelerated and shot out of the atmosphere. Jafari watched as the strobing lights faded into the night sky. As the F-4 Phantom prepared to land, it experienced more communication and navigational failures. Upon further investigation, a commercial airliner in the area also reported communication failures at the same time as Jafari, but the airliner did not see the UFO. Ground troops were sent to recover the fallen object, but as they approached the area, their equipment started to malfunction. No trace of whatever the UFO shot toward the ground was ever found, as far as we know. Approximately three decades went by without any reports from Iran about UFOs in their airspace. Then, in 2004, strange aircraft were once again encountered by the Iranian Air Force. At this time, Iran was still using a few F-14 Tomcats that they'd purchased from America before the revolution. The Iranian military used the Tomcats to protect their nuclear facilities. Considered one of the most successful fighter jets ever built, its speed, maneuverability, and weapon capabilities make it an aircraft to be feared and respected. The encounter in 2004 went something like this. An alarm was raised when the unidentified flying object was picked up on radar. The UFO entered the airspace above one of Iran's nuclear facilities. Fighter pilots ran to their jets. Mechanics shouted at one another as they prepared planes for takeoff. The pilots were secured in the cockpits by the support crew and the hatch was sealed. The only contact with the outside world was through their helmet. Pure oxygen was being pumped into the face mask to keep them alert. Over their comms, head military personnel were barking orders. An attack on our nuclear facilities could be incoming. We need planes in the air now, the commander shouted. The Iranian pilots flickered the afterburner switch on the engine controls. The F-14 Tomcats accelerated off the runway and into the black sky as flames shot out of the back of their jet engines. As they reached Mach 2, the sonic booms could be heard throughout the desert below. The Iranian military launched eight F-14s, eight F-4 Phantoms, and two large reconnaissance aircraft to intercept the UFO. The task force encountered objects that they'd claimed had astonishing flight characteristics. One of the F-14 Tomcats tried to lock on to the brightly shining objects, only to have his radar disrupted. The pilot who was tracking the object described it as being spherical and having a green afterburn. It was recorded that whatever engines were producing the green aura were leaving considerable amounts of turbulence behind them. It was like flying through a lightning storm. The plane shook and convulsed uncontrollably. The task force swung out of the turbulent wake of the UFO and tried to flank it from the sides. Before they could get into position, the spherical object shot off like a comet, leaving a tail of green light behind as it exited the atmosphere. The eerie glow was ingrained into the minds of the pilots who were in the task force that day. The Iranian Air Force remained on high alert for any further UFO activity after the 2004 event. Then, in 2012, another strange phenomena occurred. A UFO was spotted in Iranian airspace. It did not show up on radar at first, but then all of a sudden a blip appeared. It was like the ship was cloaked and had just appeared out of thin air. The military scrambled to the F-14s and pursued the vessel, but then tragedy struck. As one of the F-14s took off, it exploded in mid-air. The aircraft was consumed in a fireball. The smoldering metal fell from the sky and landed in the sands below. Some accounts claimed that the UFO attacked the F-14 right after it took off perhaps using laser beams or a highly advanced weapon that ignited the fuel in the plane's tanks. Both of the crewmen in the plane were killed instantly. Reports by the Iranian government seem to suggest that the UFO had something to do with the mishap, but it's unclear the role the unidentified aircraft played in the catastrophe. Other F-14s flew after the unidentified object. Every time they tried to get a lock on the UFO, their armament systems would malfunction. The dull green light of their screens would appear to be working perfectly one moment, and as soon as a lock was achieved, everything went black. The pilots would try rebooting the systems mid-flight, but nothing seemed to work. The UFO quickly outpaced the F-14 Tomcats as it reached Mach 10, a speed faster than any aircraft currently produced can fly. It was almost like the UFO was toying with the F-14s. With the afterburners, the Tomcats pursued their enemy at a top speed of just over Mach 2. 
This is 1,534 miles per hour. The encounter ended similarly to the one in 2004. The UFO shot out of the atmosphere with a glowing tail of exhaust behind it. Each of the unexplained encounters recorded incredible capabilities of the UFOs. In all three cases, radar was jammed and weapon systems malfunctioned when the UFO was present. It seems that once the UFO left the general area, the instruments started to work properly again. You have to wonder what whoever was controlling the UFO was after. Their radar jamming capabilities seem highly sophisticated, yet they still allowed the Iranian military to know that they were there. Was it an accident all three times? Or was the UFO testing Iran's Air Force capabilities? Another common factor between the encounters was that the UFOs all left the atmosphere after encountering the Iranian aircraft. They seemed to launch away at Mach 10, which is 10 times the speed of sound, or 7,612 miles per hour. The closest any known human aircraft has gotten to that speed was Mach 9.68. This was achieved by a NASA experimental hypersonic aircraft called the X-43. And why did they shoot out the atmosphere instead of just leaving Iranian airspace? Was there some other vessel waiting for them in orbit around the Earth? Was there a large mothership waiting to launch to light speed once the reconnaissance ships return? All of the accounts also mention the UFO hovering, which means that they could remain in the air with a velocity of zero. The massive acceleration it would take to go from zero to Mach 10 in seconds is not possible with our current technology. All of the UFOs were also described as luminous objects. They emitted some kind of light, whether it was the strobes from 76 or the green afterburn glow of the 2000s. Could the lights be some sort of undiscovered propulsion from an advanced alien race? Or is there a country on Earth that's discovered an advanced propulsion system that the public is unaware of? There are several theories as to what the UFOs might have been. Iran has claimed that they were secret United States spy planes. They've also suggested that the aircraft were state-of-the-art drones that the US military was using to spy on Iran. However, the United States does not have the technology or capability for achieving Mach 10. It also seems unlikely that a spy aircraft would emit bright lights that would give its position away. Could the UFOs that Iran encountered be extraterrestrial? Is there any evidence to support that aliens have a special interest in Iranian nuclear sites? At this point in time, all we know is that on three separate occasions, skilled Iranian Air Force pilots encountered unidentified flying objects with advanced technological capabilities. There seems to be no definitive explanation for the UFOs encountered by Iranian military personnel. Whether the United States has advanced secret technology or Iran has encountered extraterrestrial UFOs, the three events still remain a mystery to this day. The date is Wednesday, the 30th of April, 1980, and six men are approaching the Iranian embassy in West London. The men are Iranian Arabs and members of a revolutionary group seeking the creation of an independent state in southern Iran. With the Iranian revolution having taken place just a year before, the nation was still in a state of turmoil and various groups were eyeing the possibility of secession and the formation of their own sovereign nation. The Iranian government had responded to the wave of revolutionary zeal with brutal crackdowns, and two of the men and now approaching the embassy bear the physical scars of torture at the hands of the Shah's secret police. The plan is simple. Backed by the government of Iraq, the men have been armed with pistols and submachine guns along with a few hand grenades, all smuggled into Britain inside an Iraqi diplomatic bag. The six hostage takers have been emboldened by the Iranian hostage crisis, during which revolutionaries held American hostages for nearly two years and now want to use the leverage gained from taking hostages to secure the release of prisoners taken into custody by the Iranian Shah in their home region of Khuzestan. They plan to enter the embassy and overpower the single British guard there, then barricade themselves until the release of the prisoners and safe transport out of Britain is assured. If the British and Iranian authorities won't cooperate, well, they've come prepared to start killing hostages. It's 1130 hours as the six men approach the Iranian embassy in South Kensington. Just inside is Police Constable Trevor Locke of the Metropolitan Police's Diplomatic Protection Group and the sole armed guard present in the embassy. Hidden under his jacket is a concealed Smith & Wesson 38 caliber revolver. But as the men enter, he is quickly overwhelmed and doesn't have a chance to draw his firearm. Constable Locke instead decides to cooperate as the six gunmen barricade the front door and start rounding up the embassy's occupants. If he can keep the gun a secret, a time may come when he can use it to good effect. The rest of the embassy's occupants are in a panic and the two employees manage to climb out of a ground floor window before the gunmen get to them. A third climbs out of a second story window and hops across to the Ethiopian embassy next door, and a fourth, Golam Ali Afrus, the most senior Iranian official present and the highest value hostage, tries to escape by jumping out of a second-story window 
but suffers a sprained ankle and the gunmen quickly recapture him. In all, 26 hostages are herded to a second floor room and ordered to blockade windows with any available furniture. Most of the hostages are embassy staff and Iranian nationals, but a few are British visitors or employees also working at the embassy. Outside, police are already arriving on scene. Unbeknownst to the hostage takers, Constable Locke had managed to send a distress signal over his radio before they took it from him. As the officers outside move to surround the building, one of the gunmen threatens them with his submachine gun, and the officers quickly pull back. Within 30 minutes, though, a blockade of the neighborhood has been established, and the Metropolitan Police's D-11 unit, expert marksmen trained to eliminate threats in urban environments with precision fire, have been deployed to vantage points around the embassy. An hour later, and contact is made with the gunman via a field telephone that's passed through one of the windows, and the leader of the group, Owan Ali Muhammad, issues their first demand, the release of 91 Arabs held in prisons in Khuzestan. If his demands are not met, he will blow up the embassy with himself and the hostages inside. Before hanging up, he tells the police that they have a deadline of noon on May 1st. In response to the crisis, the British government's emergency committee, COBRA, is assembled. Made up of ministers, civil servants, and expert advisors from the police and armed forces, COBRA's job is to advise Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher on a course of action during any emergency. Contact is immediately made with the Iranian government, and the matter is technically an Iranian one, with the embassy being considered Iranian soil due to the Vienna Convention. The Iranian government, however, accuses both the British and American governments of sponsoring the attack in retaliation for the yet ongoing siege of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. With no cooperation from the Iranians, Thatcher decides that British law will be applied to the embassy, even if it is technically sovereign Iranian soil. Contacting the police again through the field phone, Owan requests a doctor for one of the hostages. Frida Mosafarain is physically unwell, and the other hostages have been lying to Owan and telling him that she's pregnant. Yet the police refuse to send a doctor, not wanting to give the gunman yet another hostage, and ultimately Owan releases Mosafarain when her condition deteriorates substantially. After securing Mosafarain, the police inform the hostages that the British and Iranian governments are working on their demands, and food is delivered as all settle in for a sleepless night. Late that night, though, two teams of Britain's special air service troopers arrive on scene. The SAS are elite military operators with their roots in World War II. When they were tasked to operate deep behind enemy lines in four-man squads to sabotage German airstrips and fuel depots. With a rise in global terrorism, though, the British government saw a need for the Specialized Counterterrorism Task Force, and thus the SAS was expanded with the formation of the Counter-Revolutionary Warfare Wing, the UK's primary anti-terrorist and anti-hijacking unit. To date, the CRW troopers have only one operation under their belt, the storming of Lufthansa Flight 181 in West Germany, when a small detachment of SAS operators were sent to assist West Germany's GSG-9 in retaking the aircraft. With no direct threats on British soil, though, the CRW wing of the SAS is facing dissolution as politicians consider whether they are truly needed or not. Today, Britain definitely needs its elite counterterrorism troopers. At 0330 hours the next day, one of the two SAS teams moves into the building next door to the embassy and are briefed on an immediate action plan should the worst come to pass and the troopers need to penetrate the embassy before a proper plan can be formulated. Such a development would likely end in disaster, as the SAS troopers need the element of surprise in order to minimize the possibility of any hostages being killed by the gunmen inside. But worst comes to worst, they at least have some sort of plan until a better one can be drawn up. A few hours later, one of the gunmen orders a hostage to call the BBC's news desk, and after making contact with a reporter, Awan takes the phone himself. He identifies the group to which he belongs, the Democratic Revolutionary Front for the Liberation of Arabistan, and assures the reporter that none of the Iranian hostages will be harmed. The reporter asks to speak to some of the hostages, but Awan refuses and hangs up. As the news report of his call hits television, television screens around the world. The police outside quickly work to sever the telephone lines going into the embassy, leaving the gunmen with just the field telephone with the police for communication. Three of the non-Iranian hostages meanwhile decide that one of them must get out, and they decide that it should be Chris Kramer who is already ill. Exaggerating his existing symptoms, Kramer pretends to be seriously ill, and one of the other hostages is taken to the field telephone to negotiate for a doctor. Once more, the police refuse, not willing to risk giving the gunmen yet another 
another hostage to use as leverage. Eventually, at 1115 hours, the gunman released Kramer and he is rushed to a hospital, where he is met by police officers who grill him for information on the situation inside, which is immediately relayed to the waiting SAS teams. As the noon deadline approaches, the police become convinced that the gunmen lack the ability to blow up the embassy, but they persuade Iwan to a new deadline of 1400 hours. They allow this new deadline to pass as well without contacting the gunmen, and eventually Iwan calls over the field telephone, altering his demands. He now wants the British media to broadcast a statement of his grievances and for ambassadors from the three Arab countries to negotiate the group's safe passage out of the UK. Upon hearing the demand, Margaret Hatcher flat out refuses any negotiation for safe passage, but does not tell the gunman. Later that evening, Owan is starting to become agitated by the sounds coming from the Ethiopian embassy next door. Unbeknownst to the gunman, the sounds are those of SAS technicians covertly installing listening devices through the walls. Police Constable Locke is summoned and after taking a listen, correctly deduces the SAS's plans, but assures Iwan that the sounds are nothing more than the mice in the walls. Alerted to growing suspicion by the hostage takers over their drilling, British Gas is instructed to immediately begin drilling on an adjacent road under the guise of repairing a gas main, and the SAS techs use the noise as cover. However, the gunmen grow increasingly agitated. The drilling is ordered to stop, and in response, the British Airports Authority is ordered to instruct approaching aircraft to fly over the embassy at low altitude as they come to land at Heathrow Airport. At 0930 on May 2nd, the third day of the siege, Owan appears at a second floor window and demands access to the embassy's telex system, which the police have disabled along with the phone lines. The telex can be used to rapidly send text-based messages to any other connected unit in the world, and the police do not want the gunmen to have the ability to be in direct contact with the outside world. Angry, Owan then demands to speak to somebody from the BBC, and the police agree to this demand, producing Tony Crabb the managing director of BBC Television News. Owan shouts his demands at Crab to be broadcast over the BBC, safe passage out of the UK to be negotiated by the three ambassadors from Arab countries, and then informs Crab to also include the group's political aims in his broadcast. For their part, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office contacts the embassies of Algeria, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Syria, and Qatar to ask if their ambassadors would speak to the hostage takers. But the Jordanian ambassador immediately refuses, and the rest say that they must ask their governments first. That night, the BBC broadcasts Awan's statement, but only succeeds in angering Awan, who believes that the statement was cut short and incorrect. Next door, the embassy caretaker briefs the SAS on the physical construction of the embassy. He informs them that the main door is reinforced by a steel security door, and that the ground floor and second floor windows are fitted with armored glass. Ironically, on recommendation by the SAS themselves years ago, their plan to penetrate the embassy via the front door and ground floor windows is quickly scrapped, and alternatives are brainstormed. At 0600 hours on the 3rd of May, Awan contacts the police force over the field telephone. He is angry because of the BBC's incorrect reporting of his demands and accuses the police of deceiving him. He demands to speak with an Arab ambassador, but the police negotiator on the other end lies and says that talks are still being arranged. Awan catches on to the negotiator's delaying tactic and tells him that now the British hostages will be the last to be released. He then demands to speak to Tony Crabb again or he will kill a hostage. Crabb doesn't arrive at the embassy until 1530 hours, almost 10 hours after Owan demands his presence, which angers both Owan and the police outside. Owan relays another statement to be broadcast to Crab, threatening violence if this one is not accurately relayed, and the police agree to allow his statement to be broadcast if two more hostages are released. Agreeing, Owan allows the hostages to pick who will be released, and they decide on Hayek Kanji, who is pregnant, and Ali Gwil Ganzafar picked only because his loud snoring makes it hard for the other hostages to sleep at night and irritates the terrorists. That night, under the cover of darkness, the SAS assault teams reconnoiter the roof of the embassy and manage to discover a skylight which they succeed in unlocking. Should an assault be necessary, it will be used as a point of entry, though ropes are also attached to the building's chimneys so that the soldiers can abseil down the side of the building and gain entry through the windows if necessary. The next day, May 4th, the Foreign Office continues to hold talks with various diplomats from Arab countries, hoping to persuade at least one of them to go speak to the hostage takers. The diplomats insist that they must be able to offer the men safe passage out of the UK, as they believe this will be the only way to guarantee a peaceful outcome, but the British government is firm in stating that safe passage will not be considered under any circumstances. Doing so would only embolden future terrorists. Ultimately, the talks end in a stalemate, and no diplomat is sent to the embassy. 
Inside, Police Constable Locke has refused to remove his jacket this entire time, telling the gunman that he must maintain the appearance of a police officer for the morale of the other hostages. In truth, he does not want to give away the presence of his concealed firearm, and thus he has also refused to eat any food. Fearful that if he has to use the bathroom, then the guards sent with him may catch a glimpse of the concealed gun. One of the hostages, though, is becoming increasingly feverish, and the gunmen begin to grow suspicious that the food the police are sending in has been spiked with a chemical agent. It hasn't. But in fact, the police had considered exactly that, even going so far as to consult a doctor. Ultimately, though, the idea is dismissed as impractical. Next door, the SAS commanders continue to refine their plans for an assault on the embassy, aided by the intelligence gathered from the surveillance devices they've successfully planted in the walls. Early in the morning of May 5th, day 6 of the siege, Owan wakes up Constable Locke, convinced that an intruder has entered the embassy. Accompanied by a gunman, Locke is sent to investigate the building but discovers nothing. Owan, however, is growing more suspicious and summons Locke again to examine a bulge on the wall separating the Iranian embassy from the Ethiopian embassy next door. The bulge is in fact the result of the removal of bricks on the other side to allow the SAS techs to break through the wall and implant their listening devices, which weakened the wall and caused it to sag slightly. Owan is convinced that the police are planning to break through the wall, but Locke does his best to assure Owan that no assault is forthcoming. Nonetheless, the suspicious Owan moves all the male hostages to a different room down the hall, away from the bulge. With tensions mounting, at 1300 hours, Awan calls the police through the landline and tells the police that he will kill a hostage unless he speaks to an Arab ambassador in 45 minutes. The British government is still adamant that it will not allow a diplomat to offer safe passage out of Britain to the hostage takers, and thus 40 minutes later when no ambassador has shown up, Awan calls the police back to tell them that he has taken Abbas Lavasani, the embassy's chief press officer, downstairs and is preparing to execute him. Lavasani had been a devout believer in the the Iranian Revolution and a staunch supporter of the Shah. Throughout the course of the siege, he has butted heads with the hostage takers repeatedly and even provoked them. As Constable Locke would later recount, if they were going to kill a hostage, Lavasani wanted it to be him. At exactly 1345 hours, Lavasani got his wish as three shots were heard from inside the embassy. With one hostage dead, the British government decides that the time to act is now. The SAS commander informs Home Secretary Willie Whitelaw that he should expect up to 40% casualties among the hostages in an assault, forcing Whitelaw to reconsider. Ultimately, though, he instructs the SAS to immediately prepare to assault the embassy at short notice, and by 1700 hours, the SAS assault teams are in position to begin an assault within 10 minutes' notice. The police, meanwhile, have recruited a local imam to speak to the gunman. The conversation, however, goes south quickly, as Juan grows increasingly agitated and suddenly three more gunshots are heard from inside the embassy. Juan tells the imam that another hostage has been killed, and that all the rest would be killed in 30 minutes minutes if his demands were not met. A few minutes later, Lavasani's body is dumped out the front door, but upon examination by a forensic pathologist, it's estimated that Lavasani had been dead for at least an hour. This leads the police to assume that a second hostage has indeed been killed, though in fact only Lavasani has been shot. The shooting while on the phone with the imam had been a bluff. Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir David McNee immediately contacts the Home Secretary and requests approval to hand control of the operation over to the British Army, and his request is relayed to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who consents. At 1907 hours, control over the operation is handed over to SAS Commander Lt. Col. Rose, who is authorized to begin an assault at his discretion. As police negotiators contact the WAN and begin to offer various concessions in a bid to buy time, the SAS teams prepare for the assault. Split into two teams, red team and blue team, one will abseil from the roof along the rear of the building and enter through the third story windows, while the other team will enter through the skylight. At 1923 hours, the go word is broadcast, and a four man team begins to abseil from the roof while a second team opens the skylight to drop a stun grenade below. Yet the assault immediately goes awry as a staff sergeant leading the assailing team is caught up in his own rope. This delays the second team as another soldier tries to help the staff sergeant out of his rope, and in the struggle, accidentally smashes a window with his foot. Inside the embassy, the sound of the breaking window alerts the gunmen who are on the second floor, and Awan and a few others move to investigate. The soldiers can't use their breaching charges on the windows anymore for fear of injuring the trapped staff sergeant, and instead kick and smash their way in through the windows. As the first three soldiers enter through the windows though, a fire starts which quickly
quickly races up the curtains and out of one of the windows, severely burning the trapped staff sergeant. As a second wave of Absailers move down the side of the building, one of the men cut the staff sergeant free who falls to the balcony below. Burnt but still able to continue the fight, he joins the rest of his men inside the embassy. Lagging slightly behind Red Team's assault on the rear third floor windows, Blue Team detonates explosives on a first floor window and quickly gains entry. One of the hostages, Sim Harris, had run into the room the Blue Team penetrated though and is quickly moved out of the window to safety. Inside the second floor of the embassy, Awan whirls on the attacking soldiers and raises his submachine gun, but Constable Locke tackles Awan and drags him to the floor. Still armed, Awan is then shot dead by one of the commandos. At the same time, more assault teams are entering the embassy through the rear door, blown off its hinges with breaching charges. The assault teams below clear the ground floor and the cellar without incident, while upstairs the team on the third floor exchanges fire with two of the gunmen, fatally wounding both. A third gunman produces a grenade and prepares to throw it into a group of hostages, only for Sergeant Tommy Palmer to immediately kill the gunman before he can toss the grenade. In the chaos, hostages begin to be rounded up, and within minutes all firing has ceased, yet the commandos know that not all of the hostage takers have been eliminated. Not taking any chances, the SAS teams begin roughly moving hostages down the stairs and toward the back door of the embassy, but some of the hostages quickly identify one of the hostage takers, trying to hide amongst them. His ruse is up. The hostage taker produces a grenade, and one of the soldiers immediately shoves him down a set of stairs, only to be shot dead by two other soldiers waiting at the bottom. In just 17 minutes, the raid is over, and all but one terrorist has been killed. The remaining terrorist tries to hide amongst the hostages, but is quickly identified as the hostages are all restrained in the embassy's back garden until they can be identified. For their part, the terrorists have killed one hostage and seriously wounded two others, but the operation is a major success. Iran quickly sends Britain its thanks for their actions in preserving the lives of their diplomats and declares the two dead hostages as martyrs for the Iranian Revolution. For his heroism, Police Constable Trevor Locke is awarded the George Medal, the United Kingdom's second highest civil honor, as well as being honored with the Freedom of the City of London, a rare award typically reserved for royalty or heads of state. For his tackling of Wan during the raid, he also earns a motion honoring him in the House of Commons. The SAS is widely lauded for their success in the raid, but also draw heavy criticism when it was revealed that the hostages had persuaded two of the gunmen to surrender, and TV footage appeared to show them throwing their weapons out a window and holding a white flag. The two SAS soldiers who had killed the men both stated during an inquest that they believed the men had been reaching for weapons before being shot, and ultimately the jury reached the verdict that the soldiers' actions were just justifiable homicide. The SAS, however, drew even more heat when it was later revealed that the only surviving gunman, Fauzi Najad, had been dragged away by an SAS trooper who had planned to take him back into the building and shoot him. The soldier had reportedly only changed his mind when he was told that the raid was being broadcast on live television. Though the raid was a success, questions over the use of force employed by the SAS soldiers haunted their elite unit for years to come. SAS operators and their brethren across the world are meant to be elite instruments of surgical violence, not agents of revenge, and though facing incredible danger must still keep a calm and collected head and not overuse force when it isn't warranted. The actions of Police Constable Trevor Locke, who had been armed the whole time and yet only drawn his weapon when he tackled him on, have often been used as a comparison point to what many see as the overuse of force by the SAS troopers. In the end, though the operation was a huge success, it is a stained victory for Britain's elite special air service. The two countries we're going to talk about today are seldom off the front pages of the international news media. As we write this, a news report tells us Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is saying Iran is waging a religious war in Syria and that the country has its sights set on attacking Israel. Iran calls for our destruction, but it's also seeking nuclear weapons to carry out its genocidal designs, said the Prime Minister. Meanwhile, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict must be one of the most divisive issues out there, with much of the press and public painting Israel as the villain. We won't get into the politics of it all, but with these countries being on everyone's mind, we thought we'd match them up militarily. Without further ado, welcome to this episode of the infographic show, Iran vs. Israel. Let's start with the money. Israel's defense budget for 2018 was reported as being $20 billion, which includes the yearly stipend the country gets from the USA, approximately $3.8 billion. We might also add that the Israeli defense minister is asking for another $1.4 billion to fund a military that is constantly in action. Here we will also add that Israel is to some extent under the protection of the United States, but today we'll be focusing on Israel's military alone and not its power when its ever faithful big brother steps in to assist. 
Iran's military budget is considerably lower than Israel's, reported as $14.1 billion for 2017. Although, a Forbes article in 2018 said things are about to change, and perhaps that's why traditional military sites are not reporting the 2018 budget. Forbes writes that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, part of Iran's armed forces designed to protect the Islamic Republic, is due for a massive injection of cash. The IRGC will receive $8 billion from Iran's fiscal budget, writes Forbes, adding that Iran plans to spend large, even if that poses a threat to the welfare of its citizens. Forbes says Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and Security will get $1 billion, and it seems the rest will go to the traditional military. If this increased spending happens, then Iran will have more to spend than Israel, but not by much. As for people on the ground, Israel has 615,000 military personnel. 170,000 are active personnel, and 445,000 are reserves. Add to that Israel's Shayetet 13, a special operations outfit said to be one of the best. As we said in our last show, something to bear in mind is conscription in Israel. Most Israelis, when they reach 18 years old, will become part of the military. Service time is two years, eight months for men, and two years for women. We must remember, this means Israel has a hell of a lot of young people already trained to fight, or that have actually been involved in warfare. It's not all action, of course, with some jobs being just hanging out as a safety precaution on one of Israel's many kibbutzim. Iran has a bigger force, though, with a total of 934,000 military personnel, 534,000 are active personnel, and 400,000 are reserves. Iran also has conscription, but it's only applicable to men. That means once Iranians reach the age of 18, they must do somewhere between 18 months and 2 years in the military. We might also point out that while women are not conscripted, some do volunteer. Iran also has its special forces, from the Marines to its elite Quds Force and the Sabarin Takovar Battalion, a special unit of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Okay, so what about equipment on the ground? Israel has a fairly modern and well-maintained bunch of machines. This includes 2,760 battle tanks, 10,575 armored fighting vehicles, 650 self-propelled artillery, 300 towed artillery, and 148 rocket projectors. We might add that part of this is the Merkava 4 main battle tank, which national interest said in 2017 just might be the best in the world. We might add that national interest says this about many tanks. What about Iran's tools of the trade? Well, the country owns 1,650 battle tanks, 2,215 armored fighting vehicles, 440 self-propelled artillery, 2,188 towed artillery, and 1,533 rocket projectors. As for tanks, national interest talked about an Iranian tank that was, you guessed it, one of the best in the world. This is the Karar tank, which was made in Iran and is supposed to be superior to the Russian-made T-90. Iran has a number of older tanks that were made in the USA, the UK, and Russia. We might remember that Iran and the US used to be friends in the past, with the US actually helping Iran to kick off its nuclear program in the 50s. This assistance became known as Atoms of Peace, and yes, that was a term before it became the name of a band started by Radiohead lead singer Tom York. We point this out only to let you know how fickle relationships can be, and so you never know, maybe one day Israel might not be a demi-protectorate of the US. Compared to its land artillery, Israel's air force is quite small. It has 252 fighter aircraft and 252 attack aircraft. Israel has also spent big on 9 F-35s bought from the US and also has over 70 F-16 fighting Falcons. On top of that, they have F-15 Eagles and F-15 Strike Eagles. So, while small, there isn't much there that hasn't at one point been said to be a top 10 aircraft. Iran has an even smaller fleet, with 150 fighter aircraft and 158 attack aircraft. Some of those were the ones given as a gift from the USA, in a small fleet F-14 Tomcat fighters. Add to that, some rather old American-made multi-role fighters, in the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II and Northrop F-5 Tiger II. Perhaps the best aircraft Iran has is the Russian-made Mikoyan MiG-29 Fulcrum, as well as Russian Sukhoi Su-24s and 25s. In the water, neither country is very strong, with Israel having no aircraft carriers and not much of anything else. In total, the country owns no frigates, no destroyers, three corvettes, six submarines, 32 patrol craft, and zero mine warfare vessels. Iran has more to brag about, having a total of no destroyers, five frigates, three corvettes, 33 submarines, 230 patrol craft, and 10 mine warfare vessels. In numbers, this is at least far stronger than Israel. As for nuclear weapons, we will use a quote we have used before regarding Israel, written in 2017 in National Interest. It says about all you need to know. Israel does not confirm nor deny having nuclear weapons. 
Experts generally assess the country as currently having approximately 80 nuclear weapons. What about Iran? Well, that's the million dollar question. CNN wrote this in 2018. Iran does not yet have a nuclear weapon, but does have enough low enriched uranium for a single nuclear weapon. Then we had a report on June 4th in the British tabloid The Sun that stated Israel intelligence agency Mossad had discovered documents in a warehouse in Tehran that suggested Iran was on its way to making nuclear weapons. Depending on what news source you read, Iran has them already, will have them soon, or has some good to go, but in North Korea. The truth is out there, but we won't say we know what it is. So, who wins? Well, we have to give the edge to Iran. It's just a bigger military in the end. We're not alone. Other pundits, it seems, also give Iran the edge, stating that the country falls just outside of the top 10 most powerful militaries in the world. In October 2011, US intelligence operatives uncovered an Iranian plot to kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States. And just months prior, a Saudi diplomat working in the Saudi Arabian consulate in Karachi, Pakistan, was shot and killed by gunmen on motorcycles, later discovered to have direct ties to Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Since then, tensions between the two Gulf states have been steadily heating up, most recently boiling over into a proxy war in Yemen, with both sides backing opposite powers. With many fearing all-out war is on the horizon, who would be in the best position to win? That's what we'll explore today, in this episode of the Infographic Show, Saudi Arabia vs. Iran. Iran is ranked as the world's 13th most powerful military, while Saudi Arabia lags far behind at number 26. The first and most obvious advantage Iran holds over Saudi Arabia is manpower. With a population of 82 million, Iran has a potential manpower pool of 47 million, with 1.4 million youths reaching military age every year. Saudi Arabia, by comparison, is far less populated, with a total population of 28.5 million and a total potential manpower pool of 15.3 million and 510,000 youths reaching military age every year. Currently, Iran has 534,000 active duty personnel in its military, with 400,000 reservists. Saudi Arabia's military only numbers at 231,000, with a meager 25,000 reservists. The one area where Saudi Arabia boasts a clear advantage, however, is in its defense budget, with a total budget of $69.4 billion versus Iran's $8 billion. This disparity in budgets means Saudi Arabia can bring more modern weapons to bear as we'll see later, however a long and protracted war would clearly favor Iran with its much larger manpower pool. Saudi Arabia holds another decisive advantage in the air, with a total of 844 combat aircraft versus Iran's 505. Saudi Arabia fields 203 fighter interceptors versus Iran's 150 and 284 attack aircraft versus Iran's 158. Saudi Arabia's planes are on the whole far more capable and modern than Iran's, with the majority of its air combat fleet made up of European Typhoon fighters and American F-15 variants. Iran, on the other hand, is equipped with 44 American F-14 Tomcats delivered to Iran just before its revolution and ties to the US were cut off. While still a capable aircraft, Iranian F-14s are equipped with nearly four decade-old electronics and it is anyone's guess as to their current readiness considering that Iran has had no access to American-made spare parts. To supplement its air force, Iran also fields MiG-29s, although with no new shipments from Russia, it has been forced to slowly cannibalize its own aircraft to keep others operational, and every year, the number available for combat shrinks. The rest of the Iranian inventory is made up of antiquated American F-4s and F-5s, again purchased prior to the revolution, and a handful of Sukhoi Su-24s and Su-25s. In recent years, Iran has made an attempt at developing homegrown fighter aircraft, touting in 2013 that they had developed a fifth-generation fighter capable of competing with the US's F-35. However, the released footage of the so-called fifth-gen fighter was quickly debunked by engineers worldwide as it sported decisively non-stealthy features. Ultimately, it was revealed to be a hoax. On the ground, Iran is armed with 1,650 main battle tanks versus Saudi Arabia's 1,142. Iran chiefly fields the Russian-made T-72 and T-54 and 300 American M-60 patents. Saudi Arabia is equipped with the M1 Abrams and also fields a sizable amount of M60 patents. While outnumbering Saudi Arabia, the T-72 is simply not a match for the M1 Abrams and its modern upgrade packages. With superior sensors and electronics, Saudi Arabia's M1s would decimate Iran's T-72s and the hopelessly antiquated T-54s and M60s. Yet as the war in Yemen and its tank casualties has shown, Saudi Arabia's M1s suffer from one critical vulnerability. 
They are not equipped with the depleted uranium armor that America's own Abrams sport. While this makes them lighter and less fuel consumptive, it also significantly reduces their durability. If Iran carefully chose the battlefield, sticking to daytime engagements and the flat deserts of eastern Saudi Arabia, Iran's superior numbers would overwhelm Saudi tanks. However, with a superior air force, it's likely Saudi Arabia would dictate the order of battle, and if it chose to engage at nighttime, its tanks could use superior sensors and targeting technology to level the playing field against Iran's numbers. In 2016, Iran did announce that it was mass-producing the indigenously produced Kara main battle tank, boasting that it was as capable as Russia's T-90 and could even exceed it in unspecified areas, World media has been extremely skeptical of the claims, given both Iran's previous lies about its fifth-generation fighter program and the fact that the Kara seems to be a near copy of the Russian T-90. Further doubts are compounded by the isolationism of Iranian defense industry, which lacks materials and technical expertise to create the cutting-edge electronics and defense systems critical to a modern tank. The general consensus being that in all likelihood, the Kara is a reskinned T90 variant with none of the critical internal electronics of the original. Whatever the reality ends up being, Iran has begun to field these tanks in number, and perhaps the more important point is that Iran maintains a robust arms industry while Saudi Arabia relies exclusively on imported weapons. Tanks are, however, only half of the ground war, and as proven by Russia's staggering losses in the Chechen conflict, are nearly useless in urban combat without infantry support. While Iran fields a larger infantry force, it is only equipped with 2,215 armored fighting vehicles. Saudi Arabia, meanwhile, has fully integrated AFVs into its infantry forces, with 5,475 AFVs giving its infantry far greater mobility and protection. Such a disparity in numbers means that in a war, Saudi Arabia would be far more maneuverable and any gains made by Iran's tanks would be slowed due to their necessity of not outpacing its mostly on-foot infantry support. If it's outmatched in mobility and quality of its armored forces, the one crushing advantage Iran sports over Saudi Arabia is in sheer numbers of artillery. With 440 self-propelled artillery, 2,188 towed artillery, and 1,533 rocket artillery pieces, Iran absolutely dwarfs Saudi Arabia's fire support capabilities, which fields 524 self-propelled artillery, 432 towed artillery, and 322 rocket artillery. Iran's focus on fire support platforms is not unusual for nations in its position. North Korea, another isolated and technologically outclassed nation, also invests heavily into fire support platforms for the simple reason that artillery traditionally needs very little technology to be effective. A withering barrage of 100-pound shells filled with 23 pounds of high explosive will keep even the most technologically advanced foe at bay, at least until its superior air forces neutralize the threat. Iran and Saudi Arabia face each other from opposite sides of the Persian Gulf. However, the waterway is far more strategically important to Iran than Saudi Arabia, who, in case of conflict, can switch import-export operations to its Red Sea ports, safely out of range of Iranian air or naval craft. Long hounded by the US, however, Iran has invested far more into its navy with one single goal, shutting down the flow of oil through the Persian Gulf. With 20% of global oil exports steaming across these waters, Iran is equipped with a total of 398 naval assets versus Saudi Arabia's 55. Iran is equipped with 5 frigates versus Saudi Arabia's 7, but sports 10 mine warfare ships versus Saudi Arabia's 3, specifically to mine and shut down oil shipping in the Gulf. Iran also boasts 203 small patrol craft armed with mostly Chinese anti-ship missiles and 50 caliber machine guns, while Saudi Arabia only has 11. Perhaps Iran's biggest trump card, however, is its fleet of 33 submarines, most of which are midget subs with crews of 2 to 6. While not a serious threat to a modern navy, Iran's midget subs could potentially decimate the fleet of oil tankers that habitually navigate the Persian Gulf, posing a significant strategic challenge in the event of war. Saudi Arabia has long enjoyed the benefit of powerful allies such as the United States, and with greater wealth, overwhelmingly sports more technologically advanced equipment. Yet despite being burdened by crippling UN sanctions, Iran still fields a formidable military and perhaps more importantly, a homegrown arms industry. While any war between the two nations would immediately see the inclusion of the United States and likely the bulk of NATO on the Saudi side, a one-on-one -on -one conflict would ultimately likely lead to a limited Iranian victory. 
One day early in 2007, an Iranian nuclear engineer plugged his laptop into a secure computer network at the infamous Natanz enrichment complex. Weeks later, and without a single alarm or warning from the computers that oversaw their operation, hundreds of uranium enrichment centrifuges began to spin wildly out of control, causing massive destruction as they tore themselves to pieces while leaving Iran's best engineering and scientific minds completely mystified as to the cause. Today, we'll find out how and why in this episode of the Infographic Show, Stuxnet, the virus that crippled the Iranian nuclear program. To understand Stuxnet, First, we have to understand the background of the Iranian nuclear program and its regional implications. In the 1950s, under the Atoms for Peace program, the US provided Iran, who was at the time a regional ally, technical training and a small experimental nuclear reactor with the aim of establishing a civilian nuclear energy program. This assistance continued until the Iranian Revolution in 1979, when, faced with an end of American aid and a mass exodus of Iran's top scientific and engineering minds, combined with Ayatollah Khamenei's opposition to nuclear power, Iran shuttered its nuclear power program. Just five years later though, in 1984, Ayatollah Khamenei would rethink his stance on nuclear power and decided that, in the face of a hostile Iraq and the state of Israel well supplied with nuclear weapons, Iran's security rested on the development of its own weapons. Under the guise of resurrecting its civilian energy program, Iran began to seek technical training and materials from Russia, China, and Pakistan. This would lead to an escalating cycle of sanctions and defiance between Iran and the UN over the course of the next few decades, culminating with the discovery of secret uranium enrichment facilities at Natanz and other sites, and plans to outfit ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. With Israel pushing for armed intervention and the US growing in favor of a military solution, Iran was pressured to adopt the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in July of 2015, outlying a path to de-escalation of sanctions in exchange for complete transparency and dismantling of its nuclear program. From the start of Iran's nuclear ambitions in the 1980s, Israel expressed immediate concern about a nuclear-capable Iran. The US shared these concerns, but saw any direct military intervention as potentially destabilizing and feared a regional war. Facing a hostile and nuclear-armed neighbor just hundreds of miles from its borders, though, a frustrated Israel took matters into its own hands and began an extensive, clandestine campaign against Iran's nuclear program. Iran nuclear materials were sabotaged or destroyed, and its scientists and engineers bribed to defect or, failing that, were targeted for assassination. Though still pushing for a diplomatic solution, the US saw the need to delay Iran's nuclear program and joined in Israel's campaign of sabotage, intercepting and rerouting shipments of power supplies and vacuum pumps to US facilities where they were retooled with small but fatal flaws. With Iran catching on to the CIA's industrial sabotage and doubling down on its nuclear ambitions, in 2006, a frustrated President George W. Bush told senior staff that his options on Iran were binary go to war to stop its nuclear program, or allow it to complete it. He then tasked National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice with finding a third option. The solution came from US Strategic Command, who oversees the nation's nuclear arsenal. In cooperation with the NSA, they proposed a delaying tactic that could slow Iran's nuclear program and buy time for diplomacy and sanctions to work, hopefully averting all-out war. To achieve this delay, US STRATCOM and the NSA proposed a brand new type of weapon never before used by the United States or any other nation. A cyber weapon that would not just infect Iranian computer networks, but actually create physical destruction by completely hijacking those same networks. Thus, under the codename of Olympic Games, Stuxnet was born. Spearheaded by the NSA, the goal of Olympic Games was ambitious. Penetrate the computer networks of Iran's most heavily guarded nuclear facilities and deliberately destroy the enrichment centrifuges via electronic sabotage. The centrifuges were specifically targeted because of their delicate nature. Raw uranium contains two isotopes, U-235 and U-238. In order to create a bomb, you need 90% pure U-235, but unrefined uranium only contains about 0.7% U-235. To create weapons-grade uranium, the raw ore is mixed with hydrofluoric acid to create a gas which is then inserted into a centrifuge which spins at over 100,000 rotations per minute or faster than the speed of sound. Because U-238 is about 1% heavier than U-235, 
the U-238 atoms are pushed to the walls of the centrifuge and the gas in the center containing concentrated U-235 atoms is siphoned out and fed into another centrifuge. This process is repeated over and over again, linking long chains of centrifuges together in banks until finally extracting a purified gas mixture with a heavy concentration of U-235. Because of the incredible speeds of an enrichment centrifuge, they are very delicate. The tiniest engineering flaw or fluctuation in power can cause one to spin out of control and tear itself and anything in its vicinity apart. It's this vulnerability that Olympic Games would target. In order to achieve its objective, Olympic Games would act in stages. First, a beacon would be inserted into the computer networks at Natanz and other enrichment facilities. This beacon would completely map the network and then phone home back to the NSA with security details and how the centrifuges were connected to their controlling computers. Then a new active version of the malware would be developed and reinserted into Iranian networks where it would lie dormant for weeks, monitoring the day-to-day -day activities of a plant before finally going active. Upon being activated, the malware would ingeniously play back signs of normal operations to the humans monitoring the computer systems while it was in fact beginning its attack. Deep in their control center, Iranian engineers would have no idea that miles away, centrifuges spinning at the speed of sound were tearing themselves and anything caught in their path to shreds. Because the goal of Olympic Games was to delay Iran's nuclear program, Stuxnet had to be completely undetectable and untraceable. To that end, it was designed to never attack in the same fashion twice, leaving Iranian scientists and engineers frustrated and pointing fingers, blaming each other for faulty engineering or just plain bad luck. At first, President Bush expressed doubts over the capabilities of a simple computer bug. That is, until a senior national security advisor dumped wreckage from a centrifuge destroyed in a secret test directly onto his desk. Olympic Games was immediately approved. However, like most military and government networks at the time, the Iranian computer networks were secured by being completely disconnected from any internet connection in a method known as air gapping. To help Olympic Games bridge that physical gap, the NSA began cooperation with their Israeli counterparts, who had amassed a great amount of intelligence on Iranian personnel and facilities. Together, the US and Israel created a list of Iranian scientists and engineers with two critical qualities. They had physical access to enrichment facilities and displayed poor electronic security habits. These individuals were then targeted with malware and had their laptops and flash drives infected over the internet. When they plugged into the secure networks at Natanz and other facilities to do their work, Stuxnet would then jump back and forth freely, effectively giving the US and Israel complete two-way access. Olympic Games began operation in 2006 and lasted until 2010 when a new version of the Stuxnet malware began to unexpectedly replicate across the entire internet, infecting millions of computers globally. Though relatively harmless, as it was designed to specifically operate only in the environment of an Iranian nuclear facilities network, the source code for the malware was now publicly available, and knowledge of its origin in the US and Israel became a matter of time. Both nations shifted blame back and forth for its unexpected release, but continued cooperation, and despite Stuxnet being pulled apart by computer engineers around the world, waged their campaign and sabotage successfully for another year. Ultimately, the efficacy of Stuxnet is still debated to this day, but most agree that the virus added years of delay to Iran's nuclear program and prevented Iran's development of a nuclear weapon long enough to bring them to the negotiating table, possibly averting all-out war in the world's most volatile region. Currently, women are flooding the streets of Iran, screaming Jin Jian Azadi. These three words translate to women, life, freedom, and have many in the Iranian government nervous about what the future may hold. For too long, women have been oppressed in the country, and it seems like this very moment may be a crucial turning point in history. The truth is, Iran has not always been this way. Women used to enjoy much more freedom in the country. The revolution that looms on the horizon could tear down the oppressive laws that have ensnared the nation since 1979, and it will be women who lead the charge. Before we can understand what's happening at this moment in time, we need to look back at Iran's history. Iran has undergone several drastic changes over the centuries, just like every country around the world. However, what you don't know about this region will not only shock you, but change the way you think about the past, present, and future. Sometime between 13 and 1400 years ago, Islam came to the part of the Middle East that would eventually become Iran. However, before this happened, this part of the world was progressive in many ways, even by today's standards. 
The religion followed by many at the time was called Zoroastrianism, and it provided a framework for a society that considered men and women much more equal than the current interpretation of Islam in Iran today. It's important to make one point very clear from the beginning. The problems in Iran are not the result of the Islamic faith. They have been caused by people who pervert the teachings of Islam and bent them to their own ideologies. Oftentimes, this has been done in order for certain people to stay in power. Just like not every Christian believes the earth was created 4,000 years ago and every word in the Bible must be strictly followed, not every Muslim believes women should be repressed and the Quran should be interpreted literally. It's only extremists who are afraid of losing their power or seeing society change that use these types of strict religious arguments to justify their actions. Unfortunately, in Iran and several other parts of the world, this practice has been going on for a long time and has resulted in the oppression of many people including women, minorities, and anyone with different beliefs. Before this shift in ideology came about in Iran, women were able to hold leadership roles in the government and other decision-making bodies. They could be high-ranking commanders in the military and even rule as queens in certain circumstances. Everything was not perfect before the 700s, but the laws and belief systems in the region were much more liberal and progressive than some of the laws in place today. So what happened and how did we get here? Again, we'll say this one more time in case we're not clear before. It's not because of the Islamic faith, but it very much is because of the people in power. Although there might be another player involved that might shock you or might not, depending on how much you know about the CIA. During the time of Zoroastrianism, there were still plenty of wars, strife, and persecution in Iran. However, overall, there were more freedoms and equality between the two sexes. Things obviously weren't perfect, but it seems like society was evolving in a way that would make it more inclusive. When the Islamic faith swept through the Middle East, there were still rulers, emperors, and queens as there had been before, but religion became centered around the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad. In the coming centuries, Iranians would defend their homeland from invading forces such as the Mongols and the Europeans trying to colonize the region. Just like the rest of the world, peace was hard to come by. And by the 20th century, Iran was in a similar position as many other nations that had resources European countries wanted. During the 19th century, Iran came under the influence of Russia for several decades after the Russo-Persian War ended in 1828. However, it was in 1921 when a military commander by the name of Reza Khan seized power that the foundation for modern Iran was set. In 1925, Reza Khan became the Shah or ruler of the country, similar to the old dynastic kings that had absolute power from centuries before, and became known as Reza Shah Pahlavi. It was in 1935 that the country formally adopted Iran as its official name. Iran still wasn't completely autonomous, as Britain and other major European powers still had an interest in the nation's oil fields. When World War II broke out, Reza Shah Pahlavi declared that Iran would remain neutral even though Britain ordered him to expel German engineers and technicians working on the oil fields in Iran. This decision didn't end well for Pahlavi, and when the Allies defeated the Nazis, he was removed from his position by British and Soviet forces. His son, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, succeeded him as ruler of Iran. Although the Shah held much of the power in the country and even expanded his control over many aspects of Iran's policies, other bodies within the government tried to maintain some semblance of power. In 1951, Nationalist Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh tried to nationalize the oil industry, which Britain had a large stake in at the time. Since the Shah was put into power by Britain, he opposed this idea and tried to remove Mossadegh from power. However, he failed and the Shah was forced to flee Iran. But two years later, the Shah came back when General Fazlullah Zahedi overthrew Mossadegh in a coup. It was here where things got a little questionable. Zahedi had a little help from an outside source, a player up until that point that had not interfered in Iran. General Fazlullah Zahedi was able to procure the men, intel, and weapons necessary to overthrow Mossadegh because he was backed by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. And as history has shown, when the CIA gets involved in the internal politics of a country, things don't always go to plan. Once Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi was put back into power, the United States and Israeli intelligence worked with the Shah to set up SAVAK. This became Iran's intelligence organization, which would later be used to do terrible things such as torturing and executing political opposition, as well as suppressing any dissent. Having an arm of the government whose job it was to enforce the will of the Shah would give later regimes the ability to oppress certain groups such as women and minorities. However, in 1963, things were starting to look up in Iran. The Shah began implementing the White Revolution, which was a plan to westernize the social and economic principles of the country. You can probably guess who might have played a role in influencing some of the policies in this new agenda. 
Many in the country voiced their opposition to the Shah's new plan for the nation. Some wanted to return to a more strict theocracy, while others just wanted to maintain the cultural heritage that their families had followed for generations. Unsurprisingly, the Shah used his newly formed intelligence agency to suppress resistance to his plan and made people who contradicted him disappear. It was a dark time that conservative Muslims used to gather support and unify like-minded individuals. As the Shah promoted the liberalization of the country, Shi'i leaders advocated for a return to more traditional Islamic values. One of their major qualms with what the Shah was trying to do was that it allowed women too much freedom, something that would later be taken away as the years progressed. However, some good did come out of the reforms enacted during the White Revolution. In rural areas, literacy and health corps were sent to provide support and resources for the people living there. However, this did take away much of the autonomy that the groups living in rural Iran had enjoyed for most of history. It was in these communities some of the most conservative Islamic beliefs were held, and many deeply hated the changes being forced upon them. That being said, during this time, social and legal reforms were passed that gave women more freedom and autonomy. This upset many who had enjoyed a male-dominated society ever since Iran adopted the Islamic faith over a thousand years ago, but for women it changed everything. For the first time in centuries, it seemed they were on a path to equality. Some women were already in higher education at the time, but with the reforms, more and more women applied and were accepted into college. Part of the reason this occurred was that the government either convinced or forced families in the rural parts of Iran to allow their daughters to attend school away from home. More women started wearing Western-style clothing such as jeans, miniskirts, and short sleeve tops. And while many women still wore hijabs, many chose not to. Large numbers of hairdressers began to pop up around cities and towns as women started to change their hairstyles as now they didn't need to keep their heads covered. This was all happening as women's rights around the world were beginning to advance. It was by no means perfect, but it seemed like many countries were beginning to move toward the equality of the sexes. As we know, even now, this dream has not yet been achieved, but it was moving in the right direction in Iran. Then, the Islamic Revolution happened. As women's rights and more liberal policies spread across the country in the late 60s and early 70s, Iran's economy started to pick up. Hundreds of women served on elected local councils and millions had jobs. There were female judges, ambassadors, and police officers. However, not everyone was happy and things weren't perfect. The Shah had almost unlimited power and was not always using it for good. Like any dictator would do, he used his influence and savak to make sure that anyone who opposed him was silenced. At the same time, the Iranian people's expectations for their country's future began to rise. And while this was happening, the prices of oil and goods also began to rise. The Iranian people started to become more and more unhappy with the Shah and how he was running the country as they couldn't afford certain necessities. The unfortunate part for the Shah was that he was so isolated from the discontent of the people that when he finally realized how unhappy they were, it was too late. Protests and riots began to break out. As protesters died at the hands of the military and police, people mourned them and condemned the monarchy. This vicious cycle continued for months. Protests were held, people died, and citizens became more enraged. The people of Iran were fed up with the Shah having unlimited power and not listening to their wishes. On September 8, 1978, the Shah declared martial law. It became very clear that he was losing control of the country as martial law is always a last-ditch effort of a dictator to maintain control of their populace. Along with the protests breaking out across the nation, the workers in Iran's oil fields went on strike. This was followed by strikes in several other major industries. Rioting, mass demonstrations, and protests continued against the Shah's rule. Then, everything came crumbling to the ground. On January 16, 1979, the Shah fled Iran as he appeared to have lost all control of the country. Less than a month later, an Islamic nationalist who the Shah had exiled for political dissent named Ayatollah Khomeini returned to the country and stoked the fire of revolution. Ayatollah Khomeini and his supporters declared Iran a theocratic republic that would be ruled under Islamic principles. The new government removed all liberal representatives from their positions in a move to return Iran to more conservative social and religious values. And it was at this point women and many other people started to lose the rights they'd gained over the previous decades. It doesn't seem right that when the monarchy was removed and a republic was put into place that allowed for elected representatives, social norms would move backwards. But it's what happened next that explains why Iran developed into the oppressive country it is today. The Family Protection Act, which provided guarantees for many rights to women in marriage, was almost immediately abolished. Revolutionary bands of conservative men based out of mosques around the country, known as comites, began to patrol the streets of Iran to enforce Islamic dress codes and behaviors. These men acted as a militia to ensure anyone who opposed the revolution was silenced. 
The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps was formed as a religious army to fight against another coup set by the CIA. However, unlike the Mossadegh coup, this one failed and only emboldened the religious militias to unleash more brutality on anyone they suspected opposed the Islamic Revolution. At the end of the revolution, Iran ended up with a democracy and a constitution that appeared to allow people to elect officials they wanted. But it came with a few caveats that would allow men with conservative Islamic beliefs to both stay in power and influence the policies of the nation. The new government would consist of a president and representatives elected by the people. However, this government would be overseen by a supreme leader and a guardian council made up of Islamic religious officials. The supreme leader is the country's highest ranking political, military, and religious authority. Ayatollah Ruhollohe Khomeini made himself the first supreme leader after returning to the country and taking control of the revolution. Regardless of who the Iranians elected as president, there would always be an unelected religious figure who outranked them. The Guardian Council was supposedly a mix of legal specialists and religious figures who had the ability to veto any legislation they believed went against Sharia law. This meant that the conservative policies enacted after the Islamic Revolution would likely never change until the Supreme Leader and Guardian Council were disbanded, or they too were elected by the people. Unfortunately, due to the status quo that developed after the Islamic Revolution, it doesn't seem like this will happen anytime soon. Even with the Islamic Revolution poised to take away certain rights for people, there was one thing that many Iranians hated more than what was happening in the government. 52 United States diplomats and citizens were taken hostage after a militia group of Muslim student followers of the Imam's line infiltrated the U.S. Embassy. The meddling of the United States as well as Britain in the affairs of Iran enraged people of all ages and beliefs. This led to a deep mistrust of Americans and resulted in many Iranian citizens preferring the new Islamic order to a dictator or government backed by a foreign power. As the Iranian people watched their revolution unfold and conservative religious laws become reinstated, women began to rally against wearing hijabs. However, the new Islamic government refused to listen. They mandated that all women wear hijabs as is the custom in the Islamic faith. The religious militias enforced this mandate even though it was not technically a law until 1983. At that point, every female in the country, regardless of religious orientation or nationality, was required to wear a hijab. That law remains in place to this day. From 1979 to 1989, the new government made very little progress in terms of human rights. It was in 1989 that Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini died, and the assembly of experts made up of a body of senior clerics choose the outgoing president of Iran, Ali Khomeini, to take his place. Khomeini is still the Supreme Leader of Iran to this day. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, tensions between Iran and the United States remained high. This only fueled the anti-American sentiment carried by many Iranian citizens. At the same time, conservative religious leaders strengthened their grip on the country. Even though elections were held and women could vote, candidates had to be vetted and cleared by the Supreme Leader and the Guardian Council. This meant anyone who made it to the ballot was going to be religious and conservative, otherwise they would not be allowed to run. So, even though Iranian citizens could theoretically choose who represented them, their only choices were men who upheld conservative Islamic laws and would not oppose the Guardian Council or Supreme Leader's decisions. This meant that nothing would change until someone advocated for more equality and rights for all citizens. Then in 1997, Mohammad Khatami Ardakhani was elected president and pledged to enact political and social reforms that would allow more rights for women. In the year 2000, allies of Khatami won 189 out of the 290 seats of parliament, giving them the majority. It seemed as if more progressive policies would finally be passed. However, progress was slow. The Guardian Council and Supreme Leader stood in the way of reforms, and the hope to move away from conservative Islamic standards and toward more equality fell by the wayside. In 2004, conservatives reclaimed control of the parliament after highly controversial elections. In the following year, thousands of reformist candidates were barred from running by the Guardian Council, which stifled the progress made in the country. This was frustrating for many, and protests began to break out. In 2005, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, an ultra-conservative candidate, won the presidential election. It seemed as if the politics of Iran were moving in the wrong direction. Again, this was because the real power lay with the Supreme Leader and Guardian Council. The democracy of Iran was somewhat of an illusion because true reform would never be allowed to happen as long as the conservative religious bodies dictated who could run in an election and who couldn't. The results of these elections also seemed to be rigged when the conservative Islamic way of life was threatened. This almost always led to protests, with people either being locked up or killed by the government and police. In 2013, a centrist and reformist president was elected by the name of Hassan Rouhani. He advocated for more personal freedom, access to information, and an increase in women's rights. 
He appointed several women to his cabinet, including the first female foreign ministry spokesperson, Marzia Afkam. Rouhani was re-elected in 2017 and continued to move Iran toward more progressive goals. However, once again, in 2020, the Guardian Council intervened in the fight for equality and progressive laws. Conservatives swept many of the polls, with thousands of moderate candidates being refused the ability to run because they didn't meet the requirements of the religious governing body. In 2021, another blow was dealt to the fight for equality when Ibrahim Raisi, another ultra-conservative president, was elected. It also didn't help that the current supreme leader still believed that gender equality is one of the biggest misconceptions of Western thought. This brings us to what's happening right now in Iran. Women in the country are still forced to wear hijabs. Many are pushing the boundaries by literally pushing their hijab back as far as it'll go in a show of defiance. Backward laws, such as women not being able to leave the country to work without their husband's permission, are still in place. For example, one Iranian soccer player named Nilufar Ardalan wasn't allowed to play in a tournament in Malaysia when her husband forbade her from traveling. Women have been fighting for decades to regain the rights they lost after the Islamic Revolution, but again, until old men who are unwilling to relinquish their power or change the way they think are no longer allowed to dictate who can be elected and what laws can be passed in Iran, women and anyone who want to change the status quo in the country is fighting an uphill battle. However, women in Iran are strong and they have still managed to accomplish a lot, even under an oppressive government. Iranian women constitute 60% of higher education graduates, meaning more women graduate college than men in the country. In fact, Iran can also claim to have the first woman to win the Fields Medal, the most prestigious award in mathematics. Her name was Professor Maryam Mirzakhani, and she was brilliant. It's all of these impressive accomplishments in the face of such adversity that has the religious leaders of Iran and men in power so scared. As women and reformists in Iran gain more international notoriety and support, more and more pressure is being put on the current leaders to enact change. And since women make up a majority of the educated citizens in the country and they clearly have strong voices and a willingness to advocate for equality, the oppressive rule of the conservative religious leaders in Iran might be coming to an end. More recently, Iranian women and school-aged girls have taken to the streets in protest against the killing of 22-year-old Masa Amini on September 16, 2022. She'd been detained days before for wearing her hijab too loosely. The police brutality around such an erroneous charge has led women to burn their hijabs and demand reform from the government. Iranian women are the driving force behind the protests and riots, but others are joining in as well. Anyone who wants reform and progressive change is rallying around the enraged women of Iran. The attention being given to these brave women in the media and the support shown by athletes, journalists, and activists around the world will make it very hard for the Iranian government to ignore the problem, and if they continue to condemn these women with brutal crackdowns and violence, it will only outrage the community further. Students are refusing to attend class in Iran, and women have walked out of their jobs, which could have repercussions on the economy. More and more Iranian organizations are backing these women, and if unions begin to strike as they did in 1978, it could lead to another revolution. A revolution where women lead the charge and reform the government so that equality is at the forefront. This is why the current Iranian government and religious leaders are so scared of the women in the country. They may not hold all the power, but they are smart, dedicated, and very, very angry. If we're to support the women fighting for their rights in Iran, we need to make sure the spotlight remains on them. Too often Iran's nuclear dealings are the highlight of media attention, but if these protests and the outrage felt by many Iranians lead to a revolution, the international issues so many are concerned about could be fixed. If there's a real reform in Iran and people have an actual say in who's elected and who runs the country, there's a real possibility that Iran will become a vibrant democracy. This could fix a lot of the current political and foreign policy problems in the nation. We can't forget about the women and all Iranians who are desperately fighting for a better way of life. If governments are going to enter into deals or make policy changes in how they interact with Iran, women's rights must be a part of those negotiations. Any conversation about the future of Iran needs to include the equality these women are striving for. That being said, there are constant forces at work trying to suppress their voices and maintain the status quo. In Iran, this threat comes from old men holding on to outdated beliefs because it keeps them in power. Many Muslims outside of the control of oppressive regimes welcome equality and increased rights for all women. What's happening in Iran is not a religious issue, it's the result of bigotry and a subset of individuals wanting to maintain control over others. If the world's going to be a better place, females from every nation need to be given a good education, equality, and the opportunity to express themselves however they see fit. This is what the women of Iran are fighting for, and it should be what we all fight for. Russia's stockpiles of drones and missiles are running dangerously low. 
One recent estimate puts Russia's cruise missile stockpile as low as 120 out of the 2,000 it began the war with. But Iran is now coming to the rescue, supplying Russia with all the drones and missiles it needs to hit every civilian target in Ukraine. But what exactly does Iran get out of helping Russia? Iran and Russia are both countries with few real friends. While there are several countries who tolerate or feign close relations with Russia, none of them were willing to offer more than token support for Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Similarly, Iran is also a country with few friends. It might have some legitimate political beef with the United States after decades of it propping up a dictatorship in the country, but Iran is sort of like the most hated kid in school because it's pissed off every single one of its neighbors. Israel tops the list of Iranian enemies, but while the rest of the Middle East has gradually gotten off the death to Israel bandwagon that was so popular up until the 80s, Iran refuses to let old fads die. To this day, Iran remains the only major power in the region who seriously wishes to see Israel destroyed. But Iran's antagonism has worn thin on the nerves of its other neighbors too. Saudi Arabia and Iran have famously been relationship status frowny face with each other for decades, and it doesn't help that Saudi Arabia's favorite hobby is to antagonize Iran and then hide under America's skirts. Jordan and numerous other countries are also pretty tired of Iran and have threatened to pursue their own nuclear program should Iran get the bomb. The first and most obvious thing that Iran gets out of helping Russia take even longer to lose the war in Ukraine is making a friend. Russia and Iran, along with North Korea, are sort of like your high school edgelords, pretending they don't want anything to do with the cool kids while secretly all three would faint if America the prom king asked them to the big dance. Surprisingly though, that doesn't mean they're besties, despite it being very obvious that to survive they should stick together. For starters, Iran had a very rocky relationship with the Soviet Union. On the one hand, both of them had their same favorite band, Death to America, with their self-titled smash hit Death to America. But on the other hand, Iran was a religious fundamentalist autocratic tyranny, while the Soviet Union was an atheistic nationalist autocratic tyranny. Like star-crossed lovers, their similarities ran as deep as their dissimilarities. This made things difficult for the religious fundamentalist Iranians who thought it was a sin to do business with atheists. There were more practical concerns for the Iranians, though. The Soviet Union was an arms exporting powerhouse during the Cold War, as long as a single citizen had even the faintest anti-American thought. The Soviet Union would be practically drowning your country in military hardware. Iran gladly bought up all the exports the Soviet Union would give it. There was one huge sticking point between the two would-be BFFs. Like that guy all your friends warned you about, the Soviet Union was flirting with Iran's neighbor and the very country Iran was fighting a decade-long and extremely violent war against. By selling weapons to both Iran and Iraq, the Iranians were having trouble feeling much love for the Soviets. Iran, don't hate the player, hate the game. But that's all in the past now, and both Russia and Iran find themselves in even worse positions than they were during the Cold War. Today, by supplying Russia with weapons, Iran is hoping to strengthen a bond between the two nations. The weapons shipments are also likely a different bit of diplomacy, a bit of a thank you from Iran to Russia. When the Syrian civil war started, things didn't look good for Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and they were looking even worse for Iran. The rebels had the backing of the United States of America and a lot of its allies and partners, while Bashar al-Assad had, well, Iran. Assad's days were numbered, and his regime was on the verge of collapse, and this was bad for Iran. A pro-Western government would mean yet another American friend in its neighborhood. Then Iran experienced a miracle. Russia decided to join the fight when Assad's regime was within weeks of collapse. Russian air power scored crippling victories against US-backed rebels, and for fear of launching a major war, the US couldn't protect its allies on the ground by blowing Russian planes out of the sky. See, back then, we were all still drinking Russian Kool-Aid and thought the nation was a modern, capable military power instead of the disaster full of clown shoes it actually is. Russian intervention kept Assad in power, which kept Western influence from growing in the region. Iran basically owed Russia one, and throwing its weight behind it during the Ukraine war was one way of saying thank you and repaying that debt. Iranian assistance, though, might be going past saying thank you and going straight to, okay, now you owe us. It's no secret that Russia screwed the pooch invading Ukraine and now its military is struggling with basic logistics. Iranian assistance at this point is basically invaluable to Russia, and in return, Iran might soon be asking for Russia to repay that favor. To date, Russia has allowed Israel to operate with impunity inside of Syria, leading to airstrikes against Iranian proxies and sometimes even Iranian targets in the country. This is why Israel has refused to publicly voice overt support for Ukraine. Iran will likely pressure Russia into no longer giving Israel unfettered access to Syria, which will take the heat off Iranian proxies and operatives working in the nation. But Iran might be trying to send other messages with its drones and missiles in Ukraine. 
For one, the Ukraine war has given Iran the perfect opportunity to showcase its honest-to-God very unimpressive drone technology. Its missiles are definitely better, but its drones are like the Hobbit trilogy, a poor adaptation of the source material and an even worse attempt to copy the success of its predecessor. The cool thing about the drones, though, is that even if you're ordering them off Wish.com, they can still be pretty deadly weapons, especially if you use them against undefended civilian targets. And that's really the entire point of giving Russia a bunch of its drones and missiles. Iran is sending a very loud message to America and its allies. Try and start a war with us when we refuse to shut down our nuclear weapons program, and you're going to suffer for it. Iran wants America to know that war against it won't be easy, and showcasing its incredibly moderate effectiveness of its weapons is one way of doing that. If Ukraine can be defeated, though, Iran gets yet another prize. Right now, the US is like the prom king, and its allies and partners are like… the prom committee? Listen, we don't know how proms really work. We're all nerds. Nobody ever invited us to one. Our point, though, is that the US and its allies are all sitting pretty tall on the world stage, and such status affords the West a great amount of what's known as soft power. That's the ability to influence nations into doing what you want them to do, without actually having to coerce or threaten them. Perhaps you impress them with your refined culture, and they naturally want to do what you want to do. Or perhaps you have 11 carrier strike groups with more firepower than most of the world's air forces combined. Either way, the point is that the West has status, which affords it great influence. If Ukraine can be defeated, though, then by proxy its NATO allies will also be defeated. This will be a huge propaganda victory for both Russia and Iran, who can then claim that despite the West's best effort, they were unable to save Ukraine. This could have some serious global ramifications, because if America and its European allies can't save a country right on Europe's doorstep, President Xi Jinping is suddenly going to start looking less like a tyrant and more like an adorable if misunderstood pooh bear to all of the people in Taiwan. An obvious benefit to Iran supporting Russia, though, is that it gets to show the world what its weapons can do. There's nothing better for a struggling arms industry than a good war, and Iran is taking full advantage of this to show the world that its weapons actually work. Suffering under some pretty harsh sanctions, Iran needs to turn a buck whenever it can, and showing off the effectiveness of sophisticated systems such as drones and ballistic missiles is a good way to generate interest, especially since Iranian weapons are going to be significantly cheaper than Western weapons, and most people buying Iranian weapons are only doing so because they can't get Western weapons. Iran itself is also getting the benefit of actually seeing these weapons in action. While they aren't facing the type of threat that the United States presents, Iranian weapons in Ukraine are still being in effect tested under battlefield conditions. The US has repeatedly spoken about the lessons being learned in the Ukraine conflict, and Iran is no exception. Up until their debut in Ukraine, Iran hadn't had much of an occasion to use many of these weapon systems in anything approximating a modern battlefield. Now it has reams of combat data. That data would no doubt be more useful if Russia wasn't almost exclusively using these drones to target largely undefended civilian areas. Then there's the most basic of reasons for Iran's support of Russia. Money. Iran is a cash-strapped nation. It has a big ball of dreams of crushing America but is still operating on a 7-Eleven paycheck. Any extra money that Iran can make is good news. But what if money isn't the only thing Iran is getting? President Volodymyr Zelensky suspects that Iran is also getting another kind of repayment that is basically invaluable, assistance with its nuclear weapons program from Russian scientists. If true, and this is pure speculation, then Russia could leapfrog Iran's nuclear program ahead by years, dramatically shortening the amount of time to completion of a working nuclear weapons program. This is very important, also known as breakout. This is the amount of time it would take for Iran to go from detection of attempts to build a nuclear weapon to actually constructing one. The Iranian nuclear deal greatly extended the length of this period, but then Donald Trump decided he didn't want to do what all the other cool kids were doing and he ripped the deal up. Now Iran's breakout time is dramatically lowered as detection has become much more difficult. Iran's goal is thus to reduce the breakout time from detection to acquisition of a nuclear weapon to a length of time shorter than it would take for the US military to prepare to launch an invasion of the country. It took the US six months to stage troops and equipment to prepare to invade Iraq. Thus, with Russian assistance, Iran could beat this clock and keep the West from ever interfering with its nuclear program and the authoritarian regime's sovereignty ever again by threatening nukes on invading forces. The lingering enmity between Iran and the United States is one of the likeliest hotspots to spark a third global war. While Iran doesn't enjoy the type of full-fledged support from allies that other nations wrapped up in both previous world wars did, a confrontation in the Middle East comes with the threat of rapidly becoming hugely destabilizing, and multiple major powers all have a vested interest in how said conflict turns out. 
Some may even be willing to go to war against the obvious top dog in this matchup, the United States of America. Iran's been a particularly spicy boy since the 1979 Iranian Revolution, where Ayatollah Khamenei overthrew a Western-backed dictator. In some ways, it's hard to blame the new Iran's attitude. The old Shah had concentrated Iran's oil wealth amongst the elite, creating a massive wealth gap. He also invited Western specialists into the country to help extract the oil and build the necessary infrastructure. His accommodations for these Westerners ended up violating many fundamentalist Islamic rules, and a decadent event such as the 1971 celebration of the 2500 years of the Persian Empire threw fuel onto the fire. As inflation rocked the nation, austerity measures that disproportionately affected the lower classes drove many toward revolutionary circles. After the revolution, Iran experienced what many would consider an overcorrection toward fundamentalism. Today, the nation finds itself at a crossroads, as the newer generation bear little of their father's hostility for the West and instead grow increasingly tired of the oppressive rule of the fundamentalist state. Iran in turn blames the US and its allies for sowing the seeds of discord. The biggest point of contention between the US and Iran is its pursuit of nuclear weapons, something that the US has made clear in no uncertain terms it will not tolerate. Starting in 1957, Iran began to pursue a nuclear weapons program but found little success. Faced with an existential crisis in its war with neighboring Iraq in 1980, Iran decided that pursuing nuclear weapons was a matter of national survival. China and Russia were all too happy to assist Iran in developing what they termed peaceful development of nuclear power. However, all involved knew that the cooperation on nuclear development programs was easily re-engineered toward the development of nuclear weapons themselves. In the early 2000s, the US warned that Iran was reaching completion of the development of a functional nuclear weapon. Under incredible scrutiny and international pressure, Iran at last agreed to terminate its nuclear weapons program in 2003, though maintained that its centrifuges would remain and be only used to enrich uranium for use in civilian nuclear reactors. However, an International Atomic Energy Agency investigation revealed that Iran had secretly continued to pursue a nuclear weapons program, prompting the US, China, France, Germany, Russia, and the UK to put pressure on the country to cease its weapons program once and for all. In 2006, the UN Security Council agreed on a package of sanctions meant to punish Iran for its pursuit of nuclear weapons and encourage it to give up going down that path. This resulted in an immediate 20% rate of unemployment and significant loss of GDP. The economic pain was severe, and the Iranian people were growing increasingly unhappy, but Iran refused to give up its nuclear weapons program. With Hassan Rouhani elected in 2013, the US and Iran held a series of bilateral talks over the subsequent years, finally ending in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2015. This agreement was aimed firmly at preventing Iran from getting weapons and came with key provisions. Iran would reduce its stockpile of enriched uranium by 98% for 15 years, remove two-thirds of its enrichment centrifuges for 10 years, and allow International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors access to any facility they requested within 24 days for surprise inspections. Upon Iran signing the agreement, the UN Security Council approved Resolution 2231, which officially opened up sanctions relief for Iran. On January 16, 2016, Iran received sanctions relief worth an estimated $100 billion. However, the JCPOA was not deemed suitable by incoming American President Donald J. Trump. With a cabinet full of hawks advising him to tear the agreement up and start over, Trump withdrew from the JCPOA in 2018. New sanctions were immediately reimposed on Iran as the US offered terms for a new agreement, while Iran declined and issued its own terms for remaining within the JCPOA. President Trump further demanded that European allies cease their trade with Iran in order to further isolate the nation, but they refused, opting instead for the carrot rather than the stick. President Trump then promptly threatened unspecified consequences against the Europeans. The new sanctions on Iran have prompted the nation to move toward nuclear armament faster than ever, and emboldened hardliners within the country as the nation faces its worst economic crisis since the Iran-Iraq War. The nation has long supported extremist groups in the Middle East, but began to arm and train Shiite militants in force after the JCPOA agreement was terminated. Through its elite Quds force, Iran has provided high-tech drones to Hezbollah, trained and equipped over 100,000 Shiite fighters in Syria, supplied ballistic missiles and drones to Houthi fighters in Yemen, and helped Shiite militants in Iraq to develop long-range missiles. The US has named Iran the forefront sponsor of terrorism and estimates it spends over a billion dollars arming and training extremist forces every year. 
Between 140,000 and 185,000 Quds Force partner forces remain in Afghanistan, Gaza, Lebanon, Pakistan, Syria, and Yemen, giving Iran a significant proxy force to threaten Western interests with. Under President Joe Biden's first term, the U.S.'s top concerns with Iran include the continued development of ballistic missiles with ranges of up to 1,250 miles. These could be hurriedly loaded with nuclear warheads or biological or chemical agents. Iran is also selling armed drones to Russia in support of its war with Ukraine, along with sales to militants in Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Yemen. At sea, Iran has seized multiple U.S. drones and regularly harasses U.S. vessels, while the nation launches cyber attacks against the U.S. and its interests. In retaliation for President Trump's 2020 assassination of Quds Force Commander General Qasem Soleimani, Iran has also hatched multiple plots to kill both current and former U.S. officials, though it's unknown if it's acted on any of them. President Biden has attempted to restart talks over the nuclear deal abandoned by Trump, but both sides have yet to come to an agreement. Now it's believed that thanks to the U.S. leaving the deal, Iran's accelerated work on developing nuclear weapons means it could be able to assemble one within a year or two. According to Israeli estimates, Iran has enough enriched uranium for at least four bombs. In response to the nuclear and asymmetrical threat posed by Iran, the U.S. and Israel have dramatically stepped up their military cooperation, engaging in a number of exercises together. Some of these have simulated flights of Israeli F-35s backed up by American F-15s penetrating deep into enemy airspace to carry out attacks highly insinuated to be attacks on Iranian nuclear facilities. The U.S. has even deployed its strategic bomber force of B-52s and B-1s into the area on multiple occasions, signaling a willingness to retaliate against Iran with either overwhelming conventional power or possibly even nuclear power. In January 2023, the largest ever joint American and Israeli exercise involving 6,400 American troops and 1,500 Israeli troops was carried out, signaling a commitment to respond with immediate force to a nuclear Iran. The U.S. has made it abundantly clear it will not tolerate a nuclear Iran, and this resolve is mirrored by Israel, who is most directly threatened by Iranian nuclear weapons. However, a nuclear Iran could spark an arms race in the region, with states like Saudi Arabia and Jordan feeling the pressure to develop their own nuclear weapons to ensure their own safety versus a nuclear Iran. This could spark a wave of proliferation that would be disastrous for the world in light of a near century of careful work to contain nuclear proliferation and thus limit the risk of a catastrophic nuclear exchange. There's little doubt then that the U.S. is prepared to use the full might of its military against Iran to prevent this nightmare scenario. But while Iran is significantly outmatched in every category, it isn't helpless. Iran's first move in a war against the West would be to block off the Strait of Hormuz. In fact, it's recently threatened to do just that, in response to European lawmakers voting to label the Iranian Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization. This would be catastrophic for the global energy trade, as one-fifth of all global oil flows through the strait, and Iran is well situated to enact a blockade. While at its narrowest point the strait is 31 miles wide, the huge oil cargo ships that transit the strait are limited to a narrow channel through which they can pass. The real question then is could Iran pull this off? Blocking the straits with traditional naval power is off the table. In the 1980s, the U.S. and Iran went to war briefly over the collision of a U.S. destroyer with an Iranian mine, and the results weren't pretty for the Iranian Navy. While Iran has grown an arsenal of anti-ship missiles based on shore batteries since then, U.S. naval and air might is simply too much for Iran's navy of seven frigates, three corvettes, 19 submarines, and 21 patrol vessels. Instead, Iran would rely on attacking merchant ships to blockade the strait physically. By sinking a massive oil tanker right at the strait's narrowest point, it could effectively blockade the strait for months, even longer if recovery efforts are undertaken under hostile fire. Modern tankers are certainly big enough for the job, but could Iran realistically sink one of the super tankers? Unlike during the 1980s tanker wars between Iran and Iraq, when both nations tried to sink each other's tankers, modern tankers are much larger and feature double hulls, which would be harder for even modern anti-ship missiles to do much fatal damage to. Then there's routine multinational escorts that patrol the waters, which Iran would have to contend with if it wished to attack any civilian ship. As hostilities mount and put the U.S. and Iran on a collision course for war, these multinational groups would add to their capabilities, becoming formidable challenges for Iran to overcome in any attack against merchant shipping. Thus, blockading the strait is not an impossible task, simply a very improbable one. Though there is the question of if Iran would even do it. 
considering that over 70% of Asian oil transits the strait and this move would immediately draw the deep ire of China. While China would love to see the US and Iran come to blows, or literally anyone willing to take on the US, it's not willing to see this happen at the cost of a significant amount of its own oil imports. The effect on the Chinese economy would be devastating at a point where it's already entering a period of deep fragility and the Chinese might feel compelled to actually lend military aid to their own to ensure trade continued to flow. Iran's most likely move then would be to use its proxy forces to attack US, European, and Israeli interests in the region. With nearly 200,000 militants supplied and trained by Iran, this veritable army of militants is one of Iran's biggest insurance policies as their reach expands across the entire region. Never one to shy away from terrorism, Iran's unleashing of these militant forces would inevitably lead to a dramatic uptick in terrorist attacks inside of Europe with a lesser amount making it across the sea to the US. This massive proxy force could throw the entire region into chaos, threatening global energy supplies. However, other nations might not be willing to see the US dominate Iran and overthrow its government to install a pro-Western replacement. China, for one, would hate to see US influence grow even stronger in the region. And while Russia has been relegated to the minor leagues, it too would be unhappy about US influence growing even stronger in the world's most economically important waterways. While extremely unlikely, a successful US campaign to overthrow the current regime does run the risk of inviting action by these two nations, and could escalate the conflict into a full-out world war. In 2015, a coalition led by the United States managed to secure a robust and binding agreement that would prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. Known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, the deal saw a lifting of nuclear program-related sanctions on Iran in exchange for Iran's commitment to a set of very stringent terms designed to remove Iran's current capability to build a nuclear bomb and ensure that any attempts to violate the deal and build a bomb would be delayed long enough for a military response by the international community. But what was the JCPOA exactly? And what does it mean that President Trump has exited the deal? And how close is Iran to a bomb, really? Iran's nuclear ambitions are rooted in its experiences during the 1980-1988 war with Iraq and its wish to protect itself from the influence of great world powers such as the United States. During the war against Iraq, both sides used chemical weapons against each other and the conflict was catastrophic for both nations. To make matters worse, Iraq had throughout the conflict garnered the support of various nations to include the Soviet Union and the United States who saw Iran as a regional adversary and gladly supported any nation fighting against it. Thus, Iran's leadership decided that nuclear weapons were critical for their survival as a state, a desperate need that only grew worse when Iran witnessed the US-led coalition crush Iraq's forces in weeks during the first Gulf War. It was clear that without nuclear weapons, Iran would never be able to withstand the US militarily. Despite bellicose language and threats against the US and Israel, Iran's nuclear ambitions were always defensive in nature. In truth, Iran would have little to gain by developing a large arsenal of nuclear weapons, as regional powers such as Saudi Arabia and Jordan, both enjoying a close relationship with the US and prosperous nations in their own right, would then immediately pursue their own nuclear programs in response. The balance of power in the region would largely remain unchanged, and Iran would be left facing other nuclear-capable neighbors who have as many nukes as itself and the benefit of the aid and support of the United States. Strategically speaking, this would be a disaster. Instead, Iran hoped to maintain the ability to achieve nuclear breakout or the capability to build a nuclear weapon in a very short amount of time without actually building a functional weapon. This would allow Iran to use the threat of nukes as a bargaining chip and a self-protective measure both, and it would never have to actually build a functioning nuke and thus trigger the regional nuclear arms race that it did not want. Iran's activities supporting terror groups in the Middle East, however, left international leaders with little faith that the nation would not secretly develop a nuclear weapon, and some, especially in the US, believed that Iran might even build a nuclear weapon in secret and then deliver it to a terror group to use in an act of nuclear terrorism. Some believe that the NATO invasion of Iraq in 2002 was partly motivated by a desire to show Iran exactly what would happen if a nuclear weapon used by terrorists in the US or Europe was traced back to itself. Crippling sanctions aimed at Iran further isolated its economy from the world, further weakening it and even threatening the integrity of the ruling government as dissatisfied people demanded change. 
Already under sanctions for its activities sponsoring terrorists and other regional destabilizing actions, the nuclear sanctions eventually succeeded in doing what threats of force could not do, bring Iran to the negotiating table over its nuclear program. While no one seriously believed that Iran wanted to build working nuclear weapons in large numbers as it would face its own destruction at the hands of the US if it did so, Iran had always hoped to use the threat of nukes to improve its position at the negotiating table. During talks in 2015, however, President Obama resolutely refused to lift any other sanctions from the nation other than sanctions put in place specifically in response to its nuclear weapons program. Crippled financially and out of options, Iran's nuclear gamble had failed and it was forced to accept the terms of the JCPOA. Under the terms of the JCPOA, Iran agreed to several key items all designed to ensure that it could no longer enrich uranium to weapons grade level, and that any attempts to do so would be clearly evident and take a very long time to implement. This in effect reduced Iran's nuclear breakout time, from a matter of weeks to having an operational nuclear weapon to just over a year. This was a key goal of President Obama, who wanted to ensure that it would take Iran so long to achieve nuclear breakout that an attempt could be easily detected and military forces could be marshaled in time to prevent it. The terms of the JCPOA would thus be Number 1. Shutting down of several uranium enrichment facilities and the destruction of 14,000 of its 20,000 uranium enrichment centrifuges. These are critical pieces of hardware needed to enrich uranium to weapons grade levels, and of the 6,000 that Iran is allowed to retain, these would be permanently and irreversibly modified to ensure they cannot enrich uranium past what's required for civilian nuclear powered generation. Iran was also forced to use only its first generation and much less efficient IR-1 centrifuges, and banned from developing developing more advanced models for several years. This measure effectively neutered Iran's ability to quickly develop a nuclear bomb, and if it desired to do so, it would need to vastly expand its inventory of centrifuges, prompting massive construction and international purchases that would be easy to identify and stop. Number 2. Iran's current stockpile of enriched uranium was reduced from 10,000 kilograms to only 300 kilograms. While a modern nuclear weapon can require as little as 15 kilograms to be operational, the 300 kilograms Iran was allowed to retain would not easily cover the research, development, and testing phases needed to get even a first-generation nuclear weapon. Number 3. Uranium enrichment activities are capped at 3.67%, leaving uranium suitable for use in civilian nuclear power reactors and experimental reactors, but falling way short of the 90% enrichment needed for a nuclear weapon. Number 4. Iran was forced to shutter several of its nuclear facilities, leaving it with its facility at Natanz for enriching uranium and research labs at Fordu for experimental research, though no fissile material is allowed inside the labs at Fordu. This measure simplified monitoring of Iran's nuclear weapons program and simplified military operations if any were ever needed by limiting the number of targets to strike. Number 5. The plutonium plant at Iraq was redesigned and filled in its heavy water reactor with concrete so that it could no longer create weapons-grade plutonium. This measure also limited the type of fuel Iran could use to build a bomb to just uranium and increased the time it would take to do so. Number 6. Iran agreed to unlimited and free access inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency on all of its nuclear sites, to include uranium mines and mills, centrifuge factories, and its supply chain. This also included any suspicious site discovered via intelligence assets or any other means. Any development or purchase of dual-use technologies or pieces of hardware that could be used for either peaceful nuclear energy production and research or nuclear weapons would also be closely monitored. The only caveat to this term is that some military sites would have managed access, but Iran must ultimately grant access to even those sites. With such stringent measures in place and an unprecedented level of cooperation from Iran, the nation's nuclear weapons program was in effect completely neutralized. Yet many people, especially here in the US, have for the last few years complained that the deal was flawed. These concerns, sadly enough, are largely the result of ignorance of the details of the JCPOA, the process of building a working nuclear weapon, and even Iran's own strategic goals. The most common fear is that Iran could simply develop a nuclear weapon in secret and cheat the terms of the JCPOA. 
This would be so incredibly difficult for Iran to achieve that it borders on absurdity. The centrifuge facility at Natanz was one of Iran's best kept secrets, and not only was its existence quickly discovered by Israeli and American intelligence, but it was penetrated on several occasions by the infamous Stutznet computer virus which destroyed thousands of centrifuges in operation. And this, of course, was without inspectors being granted access to every corner of the country. Simply put, developing the hardware to create nuclear weapons is a massive endeavor, and not one that's easily hidden, let alone when you have international inspectors scouring every inch of your country and carefully checking your finances. If Iran wanted to secretly build a nuclear weapon, it would have to rebuild huge portions of its nuclear infrastructure, and while it once attempted to hide a single enrichment facility, doing so for an entire nuclear development chain would be impossible. Then, of course, there's the simple matter that Iran is not well served by having a nuclear arsenal in the first place. It knows all too well that the US would spare no amount of military force to neutralize it if it ever developed a working nuclear program. And even if it didn't, Iran would then have to contend with other nations not friendly to itself, such as Jordan and Saudi Arabia, developing their own weapons, something that both nations have in fact expressed a great desire to do. Unfortunately, President Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA has greatly destabilized the entire agreement and threatened a return to the pre-deal years of constant threats of military action and retaliation by Iran through its support of international terror networks. In a move that's meant to force the European members of the agreement and China to relax sanctions reimposed by the US, Iran has once again begun to enrich uranium and has breached the stockpile limits set by the JCPOA. Yet, even if Iran were to continue enriching uranium, it would take at least a year for it to have enough material for a working nuclear weapon, making the violation a calculated bluff. Then, of course, there's the matter of transferring a working nuclear weapon into a missile platform and the development of a delivery system capable of reaching international targets in Europe and America, yet another difficult feat. In short, Iran is currently anywhere from several months to at least a year from having enough material to build a working bomb, and that's exactly what they would have, one single bomb. Fitting that weapon into a delivery platform that is accurate and reliable would be another challenge in and of itself. Yet, even if Iran were to build a bomb, doing so would in fact be suicidal as it would immediately trigger an international military response. In the end, President Trump's withdrawal of the US from the JCPOA was largely as symbolic as Iran's own threat to develop a nuclear weapon. And sadly, today we're quickly returning to the pre-deal days where what happens next is anyone's guess. November 4, 1980, 6.30 a.m., minutes before the storming of the U.S. Embassy. 350 Iranian students gather at Tehran Polytechnic. They're only a few blocks away from the United States Embassy located in the capital of Iran. They call themselves Dan Shoyane Kat e Imam, or Students Followers of the Imam's Line. They're fueled by anti-American sentiment and a revolution full of promises. The group is made up of both young men and women who are willing to do whatever it takes to have their voices heard. The students proceed toward the embassy. Several women hide bolt cutters under their shadors. They reach the iron gates guarding the entrance to the compound. Some scale the walls while others work on cutting the lock open. The alarm is sounded as US diplomats, soldiers, and staff scramble to escape the wave of Iranians flooding through the entryway. Marines desperately try to get whoever they can out the back, but as no one is prepared, their response is slow. A few people make it out dodging through alleyways to avoid the angry mob that's congregating all around the walls of the embassy. 66 other U.S. citizens are captured by the hundreds of students and militants who have now taken control of the compound. They throw everyone they locate into several rooms and lock the doors. Guards are posted outside to make sure no one escapes. The captors raid the building, pulling open filing cabinets and going through every document they can get their hands on. They're looking for incriminating evidence, and in the coming days, they will find what they're looking for. The U.S. Embassy has been captured. This is no longer a refuge for U.S. citizens in Iran, but a fortress containing hostages and guarded by young revolutionaries. No blood is shed, but in the coming days tensions will rise, threats will be made, and the United States will prepare for war. Spring 1977, three years before the storming of the U.S. Embassy. The people of Iran have had enough. The oppressive rule of Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi is tearing the country apart. Writers, academics, and activists publish open letters condemning the current leadership and the white revolution that's been implemented for over a decade. These reforms have led to economic growth, urbanization, and a move toward more liberal views, many of which allow more rights for women. However, not everyone is happy. Many feel like they're losing their culture and customs. The westernization of the country has conservative religious leaders in a frenzy. 
and many question the Shah's absolute power over the nation. A ten-night poetry festival is held at Goethe Institute in Tehran. Here, thousands of people discuss the need to return the country to its traditional Islamic beliefs. Lectures are given and the people of Iran outrightly voice their concerns about the government. They don't want to lose their heritage. There is a growing mistrust, not just with the Shah and his leadership, but with countries like the United States, which seem to be trying to westernize and control Iran. In November of 1977, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi travels to Washington, D.C. to meet with the 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. When the Shah arrives, he's greeted warmly by the President, but the meeting is disrupted by Iranian students protesting outside the White House. The police and Secret Service use tear gas and anti-riot gear to disperse the growing number of Iranian protesters. The following month, President Carter visits Iran to meet with the Shah once again. During his trip, he describes the country as an island of stability in one of the most troubled areas of the world. The coming years will prove that his words could not be further from the truth. 1978, two years before the storming of the U.S. Embassy. A revolutionary by the name of Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini has been particularly outspoken about the Shah's regime and the changes being made to the country. He, like many of the more religious leaders in Iran, wants the country and the Middle East as a whole to return to their Islamic roots. Khomeini was exiled from Iran after being arrested in 1964 for his harsh rhetoric against the Shah and the United States. He lived in Iraq for many years before moving to Paris, where he continues to be an outspoken proponent of removing the Shah from power and implementing a religious republic that follows the tenets of Shia law. The Iranian government launches a smear campaign against Khomeini, condemning his views and actions. This sends many into an outrage over what are clearly egregious claims against a man many in Iran see as a respected religious leader. One of the largest bazaars in the country, located in Qom, closes in protest over the character assassination campaign against Khomeini. Many of the country's largest seminaries are located here. Protesters take to the streets and tear down symbols of the Shah and his monarchy. They clash with the government security forces, and at least five people die in the conflict. On the 40th day following the death of the protesters in Qom, mourning ceremonies are held across the city. This is a Shia tradition in the wake of death. However, during this time, a student who is protesting in Tabriz is killed, leading to further clashes between the Iranian people and the government forces. More violence ensues. Protests begin breaking out in every major city in the country. The riots and the violence spread like wildfire as the people of Iran rise up against the Shah. It seems as if at any moment the entire country could be plunged into civil war. Festivals are canceled and martial law is declared in cities like Isfahan. Savak agents, who are the Shah's secret police force, round up anyone who is seen as a threat to the current regime. The organization consists of around 5,000 soldiers and uses torture and brutal interrogation methods to gather information about the growing revolution. On Friday, September 8, 1978, the morning after the Shah declares martial law across the country, his security forces open fire at protesters in Tehran's Jale Square. At least 100 people die. This date will be remembered as Black Friday in Iran. Two months after the massacre in Jale Square, Prime Minister Sharif Imami resigns and is succeeded by General Golam Reza Azari. The Shah appears on national television to speak of peace between the government and the growing number of people crying out for change. He claims, I heard the voice of your revolution. As Shah of Iran, as well as an Iranian citizen, I cannot but approve your revolution. Many see the Shah's words as meaningless. Their suspicions are confirmed on December 6th, when President Jimmy Carter reaffirms his support for the Shah and his government. When nothing changes, millions of people flood into the streets, parks, and outside of government buildings to protest the rule of the Shah and demand he be removed from power. A major tenet of these protests is that the people want Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini to return from exile and help lead the country in revolution. January 1979, ten months before the storming of the U.S. Embassy, Khomeini works with other Islamic religious leaders in Paris to form the Revolutionary Council that will coordinate the transition of power in Iran. The civil unrest and enormous support for the revolution have made it clear that the Shah's days controlling the country are numbered. There will be a shift in power, and Khomeini is positive that Iran will become an Islamic republic where religion becomes the guiding principle for the future of the nation. On January 16th, the Shah and his family board a private plane. The government claims that he's only going on vacation to Egypt, but his departing words to Prime Minister Shapur Bakhtiar give a clear indication that this will likely be the last time Pahlavi will step foot in Iran. He tells his Prime Minister, I give Iran into your care, yours and God's. In a matter of months, the Iranian people will be screaming for the Shah's return, 
so he could be held accountable for his corrupt and brutal reign over the last 18 years. February 1979, nine months before the storming of the U.S. Embassy. On the 1st of February, Ayatollah Ruhola Khamenei arrives in Iran for the first time since its 15-year exile began. He's greeted by the roar of applause as he makes his way through the streets of Tehran. He meets with other revolutionary leaders in the capital to discuss the transition of power, but also what should be done about the Americans. Many people on both the far right and far left of the revolution are skeptical of the U.S.'s interests in Iran. The fact that the former Shah was so close to D.C. only deepens their mistrust. Not everyone who remains in Iran supports the revolution, however. Prime Minister Bakhtiar still claims he is in control, even though Khomeini has appointed Mehdi Bazargan to be prime minister under his revolutionary council. Bakhtiar announces to the country that there is still a nationwide curfew that will be enforced by martial law. Khomeini immediately follows this announcement with one of his own, informing the people of Iran to ignore the former prime minister's proclamation to rise up in defiance. The revolution is in full swing, and the former government can do nothing to stop it. Rather than taking sides, the Iranian armed forces declares neutrality as the power in the country shifts. This abstinence from the military causes the Shah's government to quickly crumble. Bakhtiar and many other former supporters of the old monarchy flee Iran. However, their misdeeds will not go unpunished. The revolutionaries will not easily forget how the Shah and his regime tried to westernize their country. Years after Bakhtiar flees to Paris, he's found with a bullet in the back of his head. Three Iranian assassins were sent to eliminate him for the role he played during the Shah's rule. Two of the assassins escape back to Iran, one is captured in Switzerland. Shapur Bakhtiar will not be the first or last Iranian diplomat to be killed for his time in office prior to the Iranian Revolution. Demonstrations and protests have been consistently happening outside of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran for weeks. Many Iranians want the American presence in their country removed. For the most part, the demonstrations are peaceful. However, since the Shah fled the country, things have begun to escalate. The situation is getting increasingly dangerous for any U.S. citizen still in Iran. On February 14th, the U.S. Embassy is assaulted for the first time. This attack will end in bloodshed and torture. At 10.15 a.m., hundreds of members of the Organization of Iranian People's Fedai guerrillas attack the embassy. They climb the walls surrounding the buildings even as some U.S. Marines fire warning shots. Bullets ricochet off the gate and embed themselves in the stone structures around the compound. The moment Iranian boots hit the ground, they unload their own weapons at the building. Machine gun fire and rifle fire force the Marines to take cover and everyone inside to hit the floor. More and more men come over the wall and advance on the embassy. It's a desperate situation. The Marines return fire with birdshot to give the people inside the embassy time to destroy top-secret documents and coding equipment. As the Iranian guerrilla fighters continue to close the gap between the outer wall and the compound, the Marines fall back. They order everyone into the communications room and begin filling the bottom floors with tear gas to hopefully dissuade the heavily armed communist militia. But this only slows them down. The attackers run up the stairs and corner the Americans in the communication room. Ambassador William H. Sullivan gives the order to surrender. The Marines lay down their weapons and wait for the incoming surge of insurgents. There are approximately 100 to 150 people in the compound, about half the number that had been stationed there before the revolution. The staff is ordered to lie on the floor by the gunmen while the other insurgents tear through the building looking for any incriminating evidence. Their goal is to crush the spread of Western ideologies, and the U.S. Embassy is a good place to start. While this is happening, a Marine named Kenneth Krauss is taken hostage and moved to another location. His kidnappers torture him and try to convict him of murder. During the firefight, an Iranian employee working at the embassy is killed. Marines and three other American staff are wounded. One hour after the attack on the U.S. Embassy, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Provisional Revolutionary Government, Dr. Ibrahim Yazdi, steps into the compound. He is accompanied by the Iranian armed forces. He takes the leaders of the assault aside and discusses something with them. Orders are shouted throughout the embassy and the attackers leave the area without further confrontation. Later, U.S. State Department spokesman Hadding Carter thanks Ibrahim Yazdi for his help in the matter. The new Iranian government relays a message to their office in Washington, D.C., expressing their deep regrets for the incident to President Carter. The Iranian government promises complete security for the embassy and its staff going forward. Six days later, the U.S. government is able to secure the release of Kenneth Krauss. March 1979, eight months before the storming of the U.S. Embassy. Tens of thousands of women across Iran unify in protest. It's March 8th, International Women's Day. They're opposing the mandatory veiling of their face that's been reinstated by the new government. 
The Revolutionary Committee gained support from the public by promising to transform Iran into an Islamic state. In this light, they have instituted many laws and rules that are oppressive to women and many minorities in the country. It's a glimpse into the future of Iran, where many rights are suppressed and the laws force women to be subservient to men. On March 30th, an official referendum is held. The proposal for the nation to become an Islamic Republic is put to a vote. No other alternatives are offered, but the referendum receives almost unanimous support from the country as a whole. The United States tries to forge ties between itself and the new republic, and there's even talk about increasing the Iranian security presence around the embassy in Tehran. In August, another vote is cast to elect the Assembly of Experts, composed of religious and political leaders tasked to finalize the new constitution. However, the government structure being formed is becoming eerily reminiscent of the dictatorship that the revolution sought to abolish. The first assembly of experts is composed of many of the revolutionaries that helped to overthrow the monarchy, but in the future, any new members must be approved by the Guardian Council. The Guardian Council is composed of 12 individuals who are experts in religious and constitutional law. However, they all must be endorsed by the Supreme Leader, who is the highest political and religious authority in the country. The Supreme Leader serves in position for life and controls the country of Iran. So when all the jargon is stripped away, he's just another monarch or a dictator. September 1979, two months before the storming of the U.S. Embassy. Ibrahim Ansihar Zed consults with a number of Islamic leaders and associates at various universities across Tehran. He gathers support for what he hopes to be a second attempt to seize the American Embassy in less than a year. A group of students that looked to Asghihar Zed call themselves the Muslim student followers of the Imam's line. They stake out the compound, taking note of guard rotations and weak points in the security. Students sit on the rooftops of nearby buildings with pads of paper, recording everyone who goes in or out of the compound. These students cross-reference what they've observed with the previous occupation of the U.S. Embassy in February. In order for them to capture the building and hold everyone inside without bloodshed, they need to get past the Iranian guards stationed outside of the embassy walls. The Muslim student followers of the Imam's line carefully probe the police officers and Islamic Revolutionary Guards who are in charge of guarding the gate. They find several who are sympathetic to their cause. Many in Iran are afraid of the American-backed coup that will take back power from their popular revolution. The mistrust of the United States has only grown since the Shah was forced to flee the country. The following month, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini officially becomes the first supreme leader of Iran. He will rule for the next 10 years until his death in 1989. On October 22, 1979, former Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi enters the United States to receive medical treatment for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, a type of cancer of the blood. He is in great pain and only has limited time before the cancer consumes his body. Khomeini and the rest of the Iranian leadership condemn the United States government for allowing the Shah refuge in their borders when they've been trying to get the former Shah returned to Iran to face trial. November 4, 6.30 a.m., minutes before the storming of the U.S. Embassy. The group of Muslim student followers of the Imam's line reached the walls of the U.S. Embassy. The guards have been paid off. They will do nothing to stop the incoming mob. Hundreds of students quietly get into position, and then all hell breaks loose. Someone uses bolt cutters to unlock the front gate. Students begin flooding into the compound while others climb over various sections of the wall. November 4, 7 a.m., the storming of the U.S. Embassy begins. The students rush into the embassy in huge numbers. The staff is overwhelmed. They can do nothing but surrender to the angry mob. The young men and women who have broken in reassure the American staff that they are not trying to initiate hostilities but are there in protest. Many tell the frightened Americans they mean them no harm. A larger crowd begins to gather outside of the embassy. It's no longer just made up of angry students, but Iranians from all walks of life. The powerful anti-American sentiment that swept through the country means the majority of the population wants to see any U.S. presence in Iran removed forever. This will start with the embassy and everyone inside it. More and more buses approach the compound. More demonstrators disembark and join the protesters inside and around the embassy. 7.30 a.m. American hostages are taken. The Marines at the embassy surrender peacefully. Everyone is blindfolded and brought out to the front of the compound so that news outlets and photographers can take pictures of the captured hostages. A hunt is on throughout the city for Americans who were not at the embassy at the time of the assault or who may have fled. Many are found and brought back to be held hostage with the rest. However, six Americans manage to avoid capture. They dash through the streets of Tehran, avoiding major crowds or areas where they might be spotted. The group of escapees crawl through sewage, climb over fences, and dart through empty buildings. A group of demonstrators marches by shouting anti-American propaganda. 
The escapees are afraid for their lives. They have no idea what has happened to the rest of their co-workers. Terrified and exhausted, they make one final push. They reach the gates of another country's embassy and plead with the guards to let them in. An angry mob is approaching. In moments, the Americans will be spotted. Back at the U.S. Embassy, the siege is over. All of the Americans who are there are now captured and being paraded out for the nation to see. The Muslim student followers of the Imam's line lay out their demand for the safe return of the American hostages. They request the return of Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi so that he can stand trial. However, this will just be a formality, as everyone knows that if the Shah returns to Iran, he will be executed. November 5th, 24 hours after the American hostages are taken. The captors of the embassy had only planned on holding the hostages for a few days even if their demands weren't met. They are students of Islam, not terrorists. However, once word spreads of the American embassy falling, support for the cause grows immensely. Khomeini praises the students holding the embassy. Washington, D.C. has been unusually quiet during this time. It's not clear why President Carter and his administration take so long to respond, but with every hour that goes by without a U.S. ultimatum, the support for the Muslim student followers of the Imam's line, capture of American citizens, grows. Things are becoming very dangerous, and there's still a long way to go. The safety of the 66 hostages being held at the American embassy in Iran has never been more tentative. Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini throws his full support behind the hostage takers and other followers who have decided to rise up against all things connected to the United States. The British embassy is attacked. The militants claim that Britain is America's evil ally, and they too should be removed from the Iranian borders. However, the soldiers at the British Embassy are able to mount a successful defense, and the attackers give up a few hours after the initial siege. The following day, the leaders of Iran's provisional government all resign in protest of the actions of Khomeini and his supporters. Things are getting out of hand, and they will not be held responsible if the United States military comes knocking at Iran's door. This leaves the government in the hands of Khomeini and his followers on the Revolutionary Council. The U.S. no longer has any sympathizers in Iran. The populace has become so indoctrinated with hate for Americans that everyone from the highest levels of government to the ordinary people of Tehran supports the hostage takers. Once again, cries for the extradition of Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi dominate the conversation to reach a deal for the release of the hostages. November 7th, three days after the American hostages are taken, President Jimmy Carter sends emissaries to Iran with a personal note to negotiate the hostages' release. It's not known what is exactly in the note. But it's not enough to sway the Iranian government or the captors of the U.S. Embassy to let their prisoners go. These emissaries are not even allowed to enter Iran and return home empty-handed. On November 8th, the captors of the U.S. Embassy claim they've found documents that prove American diplomats had been engaging in espionage. They say that the U.S. is trying to undermine the authority of the people and the new government, although no evidence is provided at the time. This leads to acting Iranian Foreign Minister Abul Hassan Banisadr declaring that the hostages may be released if the United States stops interfering in Iranian affairs. However, this is just one concession that needs to be made. The Foreign Minister, like the Muslim student followers of the Imam's line, want the return of the former Shah so he can stand trial. And a new demand is added. Now, in order to guarantee the safe return of the American hostages, the Iranian government wants all assets and possessions of the Shah given to them as it is the stolen property of Iran. The United States openly states that Iran may make financial claims against the Shah in U.S. court, where U.S. law will determine the validity of the claims. The American government also says it will support an international commission to investigate the human rights abuses of the Shah's regime and help determine what reparations need to be paid. However, none of this will happen unless the hostages are immediately released. This is not good enough for the Iranian government or the hostage takers. No deal is made and President Carter is forced to halt all oil imports from Iran. This is done to hurt the Iranian economy, but since 4% of the U.S. oil consumption is supplied by Iran, it also drives oil prices in the United States way up. On November 4th, the United States freezes all property, accounts, interests of the Iranian government and of the Central Bank of Iran in the U.S. November 15th, 11 days after the American hostages are taken, the captors of the embassy release a single hostage. He is an Italian cook who is deemed to not have any significant knowledge of the data and intel collected by the U.S. Two days later, Khomeini orders the militants holding the hostages to release all women and people of color. They are deemed unlikely to hold any vital information as well. On November 18th, five black men and four women are released. The following day, two black marines and a female secretary are also let go. By November 22nd, a total of 13 Americans have been freed from the U.S. Embassy and are on their way back to the United States. December 4th, one month after the American hostages are taken.
the United Nations Security Council calls for Iran to release the American hostages or face possible sanctions. Billions of dollars in assets have already been frozen by the United States, and oil shipments are stalling. The U.S. calls on their closest allies to also boycott Iranian exports and place sanctions on the new regime. But the commitment of Khomeini and his government are unrelenting. They refuse to give in to the United States' demands until the Shah is returned and their assets are recovered. To make their dedication and commitment clear, Sharir Mustafa Shafiq, the 34-year-old nephew of the Shah, is assassinated in the streets of Paris. The Iranian government doesn't even try to distance itself from the killing. January 28, 1980 Two months and 24 days after the American hostages are taken, news spreads across the world that the six American citizens that escaped the initial attack on the U.S. Embassy have been smuggled out of the country. They had fled to the Canadian Embassy, where they were hidden, given refuge, and eventually returned to the U.S. The U.S. government and populace thank the Canadians for rescuing their people. Days after the announcement, the Canadian Embassy is closed in Iran. It's no longer safe for their people to be in the chaotic climate of Tehran, where foreign diplomats can be taken hostages at any point in time and held for ransom. April 7th, five months and three days after the American hostages are taken. Ayatollah Khomeini states that the hostages will continue to remain with the militants until the U.S. meets their demands. Upon hearing this news, the United States formally severs all diplomatic ties with Iran. 35 Iranian ambassadors are expelled from the U.S. borders, and even harsher economic sanctions are enacted. Iraqi forces launch an attack along Iran's border, targeting several oil facilities. The Iranian military is put on high alert. It's unclear if the United States, and in particular the CIA, has played any role in encouraging this attack. The hostages are still being held within the embassy. They sleep in the formal dining room and wash their clothes in the bathroom down the hall. Up to this point, they have been treated as diplomats, which is to say, they have been pretty much left alone other than being held against their will. However, things are beginning to deteriorate in Iran. The door to the dining room is now chained and padlocked shut, with multiple sets of guards standing watch 24-7. With uncertainty over how long Iran can endure the sanctions imposed by the United States and the growing tensions along the Iraqi border, the Iranian government and the militants holding the hostages become nervous. The United States has threatened the country with a possible naval blockade, but the militants respond that they will burn the U.S. Embassy to the ground with all the hostages inside it if the United States takes even the slightest military action against Iran. Over the last several months, the United States military has been gathering intelligence in Tehran. They know that the hostages are still in the embassy and that it's only a matter of time before the militants take things to the next level and harm them. On April 16th, President Carter approves a rescue operation. The United States will use all four branches of its military to infiltrate the city, secure the hostages, and get out as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, the rescue mission will end in disaster and cost the lives of several U.S. servicemen. April 19th, five months and 15 days after the American hostages are taken. United States forces start deploying throughout Oman and the Arabian Sea. They prepare for an assault on the Iranian capital and the rescue of the hostages. On April 24, Operation Eagle Claw begins. U.S. troops secure the Desert One landing zone. A modified C-130 Hercules lands with supplies for the mission. Eight H-53 Sea Stallion helicopters take off from the USS Nimitz and set course for the landing zone on the outskirts of Tehran. However, only six arrive, as two experienced mechanical malfunctions and had to turn back. The remaining forces are preparing to infiltrate the city when a passenger bus is spotted in the distance. It is quickly approaching the landing zone. U.S. soldiers race into position and seize the bus full of more than 40 Iranian civilians. They cannot risk anyone alerting the militants holding the hostages that a rescue mission is underway. As the extraction force prepares to infiltrate the city, a dust storm sweeps across the area, decreasing visibility and grounding the helicopters. When the storm passes, another helicopter is deemed unfit for the mission. The commanding officers discuss the viability of the mission with only five choppers and determine it's not possible and the rescue mission is called off. As the helicopters lift off to return to the Nimitz, one accidentally collides with the C-130 that's preparing to take off. The pilot loses control and the H-53 slams into the ground, exploding on impact. The C-130 is severely damaged and ignites in flames in the aftermath of the crash. Eight soldiers are killed. There's little chance that the Iranian military is no longer aware of the U.S. presence in the region after that explosion. The rest of the troops load into their transports and evacuate the area, leaving behind equipment, weapons, and the dead bodies of the men from the crash. On April 26, the Iranian government announces the hostages are being moved to a more secure location after they discovered the remains of the botched rescue mission. The bodies of the eight American service members killed during the mission the day before are displayed outside the U.S. Embassy. 
Some of the hostages are moved to jails around Tehran, while others are brought into other cities in Iran. Any hope of a U.S. rescue mission goes up in flames with the failure of Operation Eagle Claw. July 1980, eight months after the American hostages are taken, the United States has convinced most of the Allies to enact sanctions and economic embargoes against Iran. However, this has not convinced the Iranian government to hand over the hostages. On July 10, Richard Queen, a vice counsel, is released due to a life-threatening illness. Seventeen days later, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi dies in a hospital in Cairo. His body could no longer fight against the cancer that's been consuming him. This means that one of the terms of release for the hostages is no longer an issue. However, Iran still seems to be holding firm on the United States, making other concessions like returning property and wealth to the current Iranian government. September 12, 1980, ten months and eight days after the American hostages are taken, Khomeini declares four conditions that need to be met before he'll release the hostages. The first is the U.S. must return the now deceased Shah's wealth. The second is the cancellation of all U.S. sanctions and claims against Iran. The third is the unfreezing of Iranian funds in the United States. And the fourth is that the U.S. must guarantee it will no longer interfere in Iranian affairs. The United States does not send an official response at the time. Ten days later, on September 22nd, Iraq invades Iran, initiating an eight-year conflict that will cost hundreds of thousands of lives. The start of the war pulls the Iranian leadership's attention away from hostage negotiations at first, but as they realize the sanctions and embargoes the United States and its allies have put in place are severely hindering the war effort, they then try a different tactic. Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Ali Rajai pleads with the United Nations to send aid to Iran in order to help it fight back the Iraqi invaders. But many world leaders refuse to offer any kind of support until the hostages are released. Khomeini and his government vigorously renew negotiations with the United States through Algerian diplomats who act as middlemen. The Iranian demands for releasing the hostages have shifted to being predominantly based around the U.S. and its allies lifting their trade embargoes. November 4, 1980, one year after the American hostages are taken, thousands and thousands of Iranians gather outside the former U.S. Embassy to commemorate the one-year anniversary of its capture. Two days later, on November 6, Ronald Reagan defeats incumbent President Jimmy Carter, winning the U.S. presidential election by a landslide margin. January 4, 1981, 428 days after the American hostages are taken, the Iranian government informs the U.S. that they now have full control of the 52 remaining hostages and the militants who were originally holding them are no longer a factor. On January 16, a U.S. Air Force jet flies U.S. and British bankers to Algeria to meet with American negotiators. They're trying to come up with a financial arrangement that will appease Iran. The proposal is sent to Iran and everyone eagerly awaits the response. Two days later, the Iranian government accepts the agreement and says it will release the hostages. Plans are made to fly them to West Germany. An unexpected complication arises around the financial aspect of the deal. It seems as if the hostages will no longer be let go. The U.S. scrambles to rectify the issue. January 20, 444 days after the American hostages are taken, the financial complications are fixed. The hostages are released from Iranian prison. All 52 American citizens are loaded into an Air Algeria Boeing 727-200 airliner and flown from Tehran to Algiers, Algeria, where Warren M. Christopher awaits to receive them. The flight then continues on to Rhine Main Air Base in West Germany, where the hostages are sent to an Air Force hospital to assess their health. Former President Jimmy Carter welcomes the now freed Americans as an acting emissary. After their medical exams, the former hostages are debriefed and loaded onto an Air Force Boeing C-137 Stratoliner aircraft designated Freedom One. The plane refuels in Ireland and then proceeds to Stewart Air National Guard Base in Newburgh, New York. The hostages are finally free and back on American soil. Western democracy traces its roots to ancient Greece, a land of squabbling city-states. Amongst these warring city-states arose Athens, a group of men who had a funny idea. Citizens should get a say in who exactly got to rule them. Though initially imperfect in its implementation, that idea has since evolved to the free democratic nations most of us live in today. But it could all have been lost to a single moment in history. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Infographic Show. Today, we're taking a look at another of the great battles in history, the Battle of Thermopylae. In 499 BC, Greek cities which had been captured by the Persians and Asia Minor revolted against the brutal tyrants that had been placed to oversee them. In support of their conquered brethren, Athens and Eritrea sent troops. Despite some major gains, several strategic mistakes cost the Greeks of Asia Minor their ultimate victory, and the rebellion was put down. 
With Asia Minor back in the fold of the Persian Empire, the Persian king Darius I vowed to punish Athens and Eritrea for their involvement, and saw the rest of the free cities of Greece as a threat to his empire. In 492 BC, he launched an invasion of Thrace and Macedon, then sent heralds to the remaining Greek city-states, demanding they accept Persian rule. Seeking to save themselves, many agreed, with the notable exceptions of Athens and Sparta. The Persian heralds in Athens were thrown into a pit, and their Spartan brethren followed suit by tossing theirs into a well. Enraged, Darius launched his invasion of mainland Greece and met with further success until an encounter against 10,000 Athenians and Marathon. Outnumbering the Greeks two and a half to one, Darius saw an easy win, only for the Athenians to achieve a dramatic victory and force Darius to retreat. Nursing a very wounded ego, Darius planned an imminent reinvasion with plans to raise Athens to the ground. But internal politics delayed these plans and Darius died of old age. Seeking to avenge the pride of his dead father, Xerxes prepared for a decisive campaign to end Greek independence forever. Remembering well the lessons at Marathon, Xerxes took his time to build a sizable force. Though some historical accounts tell of a force of up to two and a half million strong, these are almost certainly gross exaggerations, and it's more likely that Xerxes marched with 200,000 to 250,000. Though for the ancient world this would certainly have been an incredible and mind-boggling number, Xerxes' plan was simple – march into Greece through the north and outflank any Greek defenders by landing his navy behind them along the Greek coast. Many Greeks feared Xerxes' invasion force and remembered well the fate of Eritrea in the first invasion, which was raised to the ground and all of its people enslaved. Thus, many Greek cities bid for peace, but Athens and Sparta, along with some key allies, would hear nothing of it. Spartan King Leonidas marshaled a force of 300 of his personal bodyguards and helots and took command of the briefly unified Greek forces numbering at 7,000. Despite the way the battle was popularized by popular culture and entertainment such as the film 300, the bulk of the Spartan army did not march in support of its king because the Spartans greatly feared that the helots they held as slaves might break into an all-out revolt if the army left and didn't take them with them. Knowing victory would be impossible if the Persian forces simply outflanked them by sea, Athens marshaled a force of 271 triremes to sail into battle against 1,207 Persian ships. Outnumbered both on land and at sea, the Greeks stood little chance of victory. A collapse of the Spartan position at Thermopylae would allow the fleet to be flanked and a defeat at sea would place the ground defense in jeopardy. Outnumbered by incredible ratios, victory was unlikely, a fact Athens knew well as it had already begun the evacuation of the city. The Combatants The Persian army at the time was equipped for battle on the plains of Asia and as such wore mostly leather and cloth armor and shields made of wicker. They carried short spears and wielded large daggers and swords. Most notably, the Persians, likely accustomed to fighting less well-armored opponents than the Greeks, made extensive use of archers, which was part of the reason of their defeat at Marathon. The lightly armored Persian archers could not penetrate the armor of the Athenian forces, and when close to melee range were made short work of. Leading the Persian troops was a force of 10,000 immortals, a cadre of elite soldiers famed for always maintaining a standing force of exactly 10,000, hence the name Immortals. When any member was killed, wounded, or became sick, they were immediately replaced, thus leaving the Immortals a cohesive unit through any conflict. The Immortals were Persia's elite heavy infantry and often served as guards to the god kings themselves. At sea, the Persians fielded the warship of the day, the Trireme. Powered by a combination of sails and oars, triremes were equipped with a bronze-sheathed battering ram, which it used to ram enemy vessels. However, it's unlikely that these violent crashes would actually sink an enemy ship, and most of the fighting was done in hand-to-hand -hand combat by the marines and slaves who manned the ships. Formidable for their time, triremes were also notoriously poor seagoing vessels and had to stick close to shore and operate only during relatively calm seas. A series of storms prior to the battle would see nearly a third of the Persian fleet sunk, severely lowering their naval power. 
To complicate matters, a great deal of the Persian fleet was also made of supply and support vessels, not dedicated warships, as opposed to the military vessels and crews of the Athenians and their allies. Greek ground forces were far better equipped for combat than their Persian counterparts. A Greek hoplite's primary weapon was a 2-3 meter spear with a leaf-shaped blade at one end and a short spike at the other. This allowed Greek troops to fight in the famed phalanx formation, and presented any would-be attackers with a unified front of long spears to contend with. Armed as they were with shorter spears and swords, the Persians found this difficult to overcome. Greek infantry was also equipped with large bronze layered shields called hoplons, which offered unparalleled protection versus the wicker shield in use by the Persians. On their bodies, Greek soldiers wore heavy bronze breastplates, bronze greaves, and helmets also made of bronze. The use of bronze and heavy armor would prove to be a decisive advantage for the Greeks. At sea, the mostly Athenian fleet was also equipped with a trireme. However, unlike the Persian forces, nearly all of the Greek ships were military vessels. Having become rich from their silver mines, the Athenians had decided to invest heavily into a formidable fleet, which in turn made them undisputed masters of the Aegean. The Battle as Persian forces marched into Greece, Leonidas led his small army for the pass at Thermopylae, which at the time was no more than 50 feet across, and bordered on one side by tall cliffs and the ocean on the other. The pass allowed Greek forces to make the best use of their formidable phalanx formation, while completely denying the Persians the advantage of their overwhelming numbers. Massing his forces before the Greek position, Xerxes dispatched a spy to ascertain what the Greeks were up to, only for the astonished spy to return and report that the Greeks were stripping nude for exercise and fixing each other's hair, a common tradition especially among the Spartans. Sending a formal messenger, Xerxes offered the assembled Greeks a truce. The defenders should surrender and become allies to Xerxes in exchange for being allowed to retreat unharmed and being granted some of the lands of those who resisted. The offer was debated amongst the assembled Greeks, with many wanting to accept it, including a number of Spartans. But in the end, it was Leonidas' leadership that kept the alliance together. Infuriated by the rejection, Xerxes ordered his troops forward into battle. Funneled into the narrow pass, the Persian forces ran into the shields and spears of the Greek defenders, not making so much as a dent. Armed with short spears and swords, Persian forces could not penetrate the layers of the Greek phalanx, and thousands died while the Greeks suffered few losses. Enraged, Xerxes ordered his infamous immortals into the fray, confident of their victory. Yet even the immortals met with the same fate, death, on the spear points and shields of the Greek phalanx. Meanwhile at sea, a storm had scattered and decimated the Persian fleet, allowing the smaller and much more mobile Greek fleet to target small scattered groups of Persian ships and destroy them. On the first day alone, the Greeks captured 30 ships and destroyed many more. And on the second day of the battle, the Greek navy completely destroyed the flotilla of the Cilicians, a vassal of the Persian Empire. Despite all odds, it seemed victory may have just been possible. Yet, at the night of the second day, fate turned against the Greek defenders, or perhaps the inevitability of facing off against such overwhelming numbers. Though legend states that a Greek defector known as Ephialtes contacted Xerxes and offered to show the Persians a route around the Greek position, in all likelihood it was simply a matter of time that Persian scouts discovered the hidden path. Knowing the secret of the path, Leonidas stationed a force of 100 to defend it. But caught by surprise, the defenders were quickly scattered by advancing Persian forces. Receiving news of imminent encirclement, Leonidas considered his options and chose to order the majority of his forces to retreat, while making one last stand against the advancing Persians. Death was certain, and history has long debated why Leonidas chose to stay and fight. Some accounts state that an oracle had declared that Sparta would only be saved by the death of one of its kings, and thus Leonidas was prompted by prophecy. However, in all all likelihood, Leonidas chose to stay and fight as a matter of sheer military necessity. Without a rear guard to protect the Greek retreat, retreating forces would be decimated by the advancing Persians. Prudent. But given the character of Leonidas and his agreement to ally with Athens and other
other former enemies. It's also likely that Leonidas' choice was based on some level of idealism as well. For centuries, Greece had been divided, and in fact many historians agree that if Greece had ever unified and remained unified, it could have conquered the ancient world and then resisted the future advances of the Macedonians and Romans. Sadly though, Greece remained a fractured land of warring city-states, and only in this time of great need had the bitterest of rivals allied together for their shared defense. If Leonidas could ensure the retreat of a unified Greek force and then make one last valiant stand against these foreign invaders, perhaps his sacrifice could rally the rest of Greece and show them they were capable of standing side by side as free Greeks, not enemies. Holding his ground with his remaining Spartans, a force of Thespians and Thebans, the Greeks reformed into a compact phalanx, with the exception of the Thebans, who surrendered to Xerxes without a fight. Flanked on both sides, a final battle raged with terrible violence, and yet despite being outnumbered, superior Greek training and equipment took a heavy toll on the Persians. Leonidas was eventually killed, though his surviving Spartans viciously fought back Persian forces four times to retrieve his body. Eventually, even these Spartans were overcome, and Leonidas' body was crucified, his head placed on a stake to serve as a warning against further insurrection. At sea, the battle also took a turn for the worst. Despite two days of stunning successes, Persian naval forces regrouped on the third day and won a decisive victory against the Greek fleet. Knowing that the battle at Thermopylae had been lost, Greek forces retreated to assist in the final evacuation of Athens. The Battle of Thermopylae would come to be known as a Pyrrhic victory, or a victory where the cost is so high that it can hardly be considered a victory at all. Xerxes had his revenge against Athens, yet as his troops arrived in the city, it had already been evacuated of all but the most stubborn of elders. Raising the city to the ground, Athens was nevertheless preserved in spirit, as its population had already fled. Though the ground battle at Thermopylae is the engagement that history remembers best, it was actually the battle waged by the mostly Athenian fleets at Artemisium that would inevitably lead to the defeat of the Persian forces. A minor military victory at the time, the battles at Artemisium nevertheless gave Greek forces an insight into how the Persian fleet operated and allowed them to devise plans to defeat them in future battles. It also weakened the Persian fleet. Losses which combined with those suffered at sea during freaks storms that preceded the battle were hard to replace. Despite their recent defeat, the Athenian general Themistocles persuaded the Greek allies into one decisive engagement against the Persians. Knowing that if they could be defeated at sea, Xerxes' ground forces would be forced to retreat as well. Lured into the narrow straits of Salamis by a cunning ploy on Themistocles' behalf, the Persian fleet bottled up and unable to maneuver was handily defeated. With supply lines cut off and his navy decimated, Xerxes retreated to Asia with most of his army but left a sizable portion to continue the conquest of Greece. One year later though, a unified Greek force engaged the Persian army at the Battle of Plataea and secured a decisive victory effectively ending the Persian threat to the Greek mainland. The importance of Thermopylae was manifold for the Greek people, yet of greatest import may perhaps have been the evacuation of the Athenian people, bought and paid for by the blood of the brave men who defended that narrow pass for three days. This preserved Athenian culture, and with so many of our modern values tracing their roots to ancient Greece, who can know what our world might look like today had Athens been eradicated as planned? Though perhaps we would have barely noticed the difference. Demonized as they have been in popular media by films such as 300, the Persians actually made many contributions to the development of democracy and were a fairly progressive people. In the end, the failed conquest of Greece and the great sacrifices at the Battle of Thermopylae may have all been for nothing more significant than the failed ambitions of human ego. Leonidas and his 300 Spartan warriors are surrounded by Persian forces. The Spartans deflect blow after blow with their shields as enemy soldiers crash against them like a wave in a storm. Spears shoot out of the Spartan line like lightning, tearing through enemy flesh, but they are vastly outnumbered. Many began to fall. Shields are splintered, spears broken in two. Leonidas and his 300 Spartans retreat up a hill to make their final stand. Suddenly an arrow enters the chest of the great king. Leonidas falls to the ground as his blood soaks into the earth around him. The Battle of Thermopylae went down in history as one of the most awe-inspiring fights of all time, but how much of what we see on the big screen and TV is actually true? Not everything you've watched or read about the Battle of Thermopylae is correct, 
But some truths are even more incredible than the dramatizations of Hollywood. The invasion of Greece by the Persians was predicated on revenge more than anything else. Xerxes, the ruler of the Persian Empire, had lived with the brutal defeat of his father's forces by the Greeks at the Battle of Marathon. His father was Darius, king of everything, and everyone from Egypt to West India. But he never managed to conquer the Greeks. The inability to defeat the Greeks was both a devastating blow and a humiliating blunder for the ruling family of Persia. Xerxes was determined to crush the insolence of the Greeks once and for all. Ten years after the failed invasion of Greece by Darius, Xerxes would launch his own campaign into the heart of the country to the west. This time, however, the Spartans of legend would join the battle. There would be so much bloodshed and destruction during the Battle of Thermopylae that the final stand of the 300 would never be forgotten. In 480 BCE, Xerxes and his forces began marching toward the center of Greece toward Athens. At the time, many Greek city-states were warring with one another. But when Athens received word of their impending doom at the hands of the Persians, they pleaded with the other Greek city-states to form an army to stop the invasion force. The Athenians had been able to fend off Darius and his forces in the past, but Xerxes commanded an army many times larger than his father. Surprisingly, Sparta answered Athens' plea for help. Up until that point, Sparta had stayed out of conflicts with Persia. But the leaders of the great city-states saw this new threat to their people and land as too great to ignore and decided the Persians must be stopped at all costs. From scouting missions and allies to the east, the Greeks received word that Xerxes' army was enormous. It was estimated that he commanded somewhere between 100,000 and 300,000 men. This military force would be much harder to defeat than the one Darius had brought with him a decade earlier. If the Greeks were not prepared, this would spell the end of democracy and their very way of life. Sparta knew that the only way Greece would be able to survive this invasion would be if they could gather soldiers from across the city-states together, but this would take time. It was decided that the only possibility for success would be if Xerxes' forces could be slowed down, giving Greece more time to organize their defenses. Scouts were sent across the lands of Greece to find a location to make a stand, some place where the number of soldiers Xerxes had wouldn't matter. Tensions were high as some Greek city-states refused to join the cause, while others blatantly backed the Persian forces and welcomed their new overlords. But Sparta and Athens would not let the progress they'd made and the freedoms their people enjoyed be taken away by a foreign power. The scouts eventually returned with a location that suited their needs. There was a narrow pass at Thermopylae that the Persian army would need to pass through to get from northern Greece into the center where Athens and Sparta were located. Thermopylae also sat near waterways that connected mainland Greece to the Aegean Sea which meant Athens' formidable navy would be able to hold off Persian ships and prevent any forces from landing on the shores behind Thermopylae. This would stop the Persians from circling behind the Greek forces deployed at the narrow pass, making sure the only way into central Greece was by land. It was the best possible location for a defense, and the Greeks' only hope for slowing down the swarm of Persian soldiers approaching their lands. However, this location was literally the spitting image of hell. The location was named Thermopylae, which translates to hot gates because the landscape was filled with hot sulfur springs. This created an eerie mist that covered parts of the battlefield and a terrible smell. A more ominous location could not have been chosen even if they'd tried. The Greeks' plan to slow Xerxes now had its foundation, but there was a problem. Xerxes was already close, and there wasn't enough time to send all of the Greek armies to Thermopylae. In fact, many city-states still didn't think there was an invasion force coming at all. It also didn't help that the Olympics and several important religious festivals were happening at the end of the summer, which would be at the same time that Xerxes' forces would reach the hot gates. Many city-states were so focused on these other events that they couldn't be bothered by something as trivial as a massive invasion force knocking on their front door. Sparta decided they couldn't wait for the rest of Greece to come to their senses. They needed to send a force to secure the hot gates and give the rest of the city-states time to organize their militaries. After weighing their options, Sparta determined that they needed to send one of their two kings and a force of 300 elite soldiers to Thermopylae to hold the hot gates as long as possible. The king chosen for this mission was Leonidas. But before he could head out, Sparta needed to speak with the oracle at Delphi. This was not an uncommon occurrence. The oracle needed to be consulted before going to war and making major decisions. However, when the oracle looked into the future, they had bad news for the Spartans. The oracle foretold that the Persians would destroy either Sparta as a whole or one of the kings of Sparta would need to die. When this prophecy reached Leonidas, he did not hesitate for a moment. He would gladly lay down his own life if it meant securing victory for Sparta. Now that the oracle had been consulted, Leonidas needed to select his 300 soldiers and head to Thermopylae to prepare for battle. It seems likely that Leonidas knew that he and his forces would not be making it back alive, as he only chose men who had already had a male heir to carry on their family lineage. Spartan warriors fought until victory or death, 
and since they were so outnumbered and the main objective was to slow Xerxes down as much as possible, no one was coming home. Also, Leonidas had the Oracle's prophecy to contend with, unless he somehow managed to defeat 100,000 men with his 300 Spartans and a handful of other Greek soldiers, he would need to fight to the death in order to ensure the prophecy was fulfilled and Sparta itself did not fall. Sparta recruited as many other soldiers as possible for the mission from their allies and the surrounding area. The Athenians were in charge of protecting the seas, so they could only offer a limited number of soldiers upon land. Upon departure for Thermopylae, Leonidas had his army of 300 Spartan soldiers and around 7,000 other men made up of Athenians, 1,000 Phocians, 700 Thespians, and 400 Thebans. The force marched from central Greece to Thermopylae. The stage was set for the greatest battle in ancient history. In late July or early August of 480 BCE, Leonidas and his forces reached the hot gates and set up their defenses. They were a few days ahead of the Persians, which gave them time to scout out the area and make sure everyone knew what to do during battle. The Spartans were hardened warriors who had fought in wars before. However, the same could not be said about all the soldiers that made up the rest of Leonidas' resistance force. The pass through the hot gates was approximately 20 to 100 meters across. On one side was a sheer cliff that dropped into a sea below. On the other were impenetrable jagged mountains. With his 300 Spartans at the front and in key positions along the opening of the pass, Leonidas could fend off the oncoming Persian forces. The narrowness of the hot gates rendered the number advantage that Xerxes had over the Greeks almost completely useless and would mean that his cavalry wouldn't be able to outflank Greek forces. But would this be enough to allow Leonidas and his men to slow the Persian army? Only time would tell. Up until this point, Xerxes and his military had met little resistance. They had marched across the Persian Empire, crossed the Dardanelles Strait on two pontoon bridges, and made their way through northern Greece to Thermopylae. As Leonidas waited for the Persian army to reach the hot gates, he sent men out to scout the area. Everything seemed to be going according to plan. The Spartans and their allies were eating and preparing themselves for battle when one of the scouts frantically returned to the camp. He had terrible news. A hidden path in the mountains led from where the Persians would be camped to behind the Greek line. If the Persians discovered the trail, they'd be able to surround the Greeks and massacre them. Leonidas didn't have enough men to fend off attacks from both the front and the back of his resistance force. Leonidas sent 1,000 Phocians to guard the path in case the Persians discovered it. When Xerxes and his forces finally arrived at Thermopylae, they decided to wait four days before commencing their attack. One reason for this was to give the Persian troops time to rest, but Xerxes also had something else in mind. He was almost positive that when the Greeks saw the size of his army, they'd run away in fear. Much to the dismay of Xerxes, this did not happen. The Spartans had no intention of giving up Thermopylae and letting the Persians pass without a fight. After waiting a few days to see if the Greeks would just give up, Xerxes sent an envoy to ask Leonidas to lay down his arms. According to the philosopher Plutarch, Leonidas' response was come and take them. Xerxes did not receive this defiance very well and decided it was time to prepare for battle. Before launching his first attacks, he sent scouts to see how the Spartans were doing in preparation for battle. Their report shocked the Persian king. The scouts had found the Spartans exercising naked and grooming each other's hair. The reason for this likely had to do with the religious and funerary beliefs of the Spartans. Since Spartan soldiers fought until they were victorious or dead, they needed to ensure their bodies were prepared for the afterlife. Therefore, before a battle, they would groom each other. Another little-known fact about the way Spartans looked was that all Spartan men shaved their upper lip. Like most Greek men, they still let their beards grow long, but the upper lip was always shaved. Five days after arriving in Thermopylae, Xerxes ordered his troops forward. He was sure that the superior numbers would make quick work of the small Greek force, so he initially sent only his most mediocre soldiers into battle. Xerxes quickly found out that this was a huge mistake. The Spartans' fighting ability was unmatched by any other soldiers in the field. The Greeks had been practicing their tactics on the rough terrain of Thermopylae for several days, which also gave them a slight advantage. They used a phalanx formation, which was extremely effective in the tight spaces of the hot gates, and the Greek warriors would stand shoulder to shoulder forming a wall of shields in front of them. Wave after wave of Persian soldiers crashed against the Greek line, but it did not break. The phalanx was so successful because the Greek shields were stronger than the Persian weapons and their spears provided a further reach. The Persians were using short javelins and wicker shields. These definitely provided them an advantage in open field combat as they offered more mobility, but in the tight quarters of Thermopylae, these weapons were just not as effective against the heavily armed Spartans. It seemed that no matter what they did, the Persians couldn't get past the front line of the Greeks. Leonidas and his Spartans were fierce. They would patiently wait for a buildup of Persian soldiers against their shields and then use their spears from further back to decimate any enemy who left themselves vulnerable to attack. Imagine being a Persian soldier and watching line after line of your comrades die at the hands of Spartan warriors. Each wave of attack brings you closer to the deadly phalanx. You find yourself face to face with Greek shields. At your feet are the dead bodies of your friends. 
You look up and lock eyes with Leonidas as his spear rockets out from behind the phalanx and through your heart. It's no wonder that many Persian soldiers turned and fled the battlefield after witnessing the carnage that the Spartans unleashed. After hours of battling, the ground was soaked in Persian blood while the Greeks sustained minor casualties. Xerxes realized he needed to try a different tactic and ordered his archers to release a barrage of arrows at the Spartan forces. Unfortunately for the Persians, their arrows were about as effective as their soldiers were against the Greek shields and armor, which is to say they had little to no effect at all. For two days, everything went according to plan for Leonidas and his army. Even Xerxes' most elite fighters, the Immortals, couldn't defeat the Spartans and their allies. This group of soldiers got its name from the ability to immediately replace casualties, making it seem that their numbers never diminished. However, the Greeks' luck was about to change. It was said that during the first two days of battle, the Spartans and other Greek forces killed over 10,000 Persian soldiers. They sustained some of their own casualties, but most of the Greek force was still strong and could continue fighting indefinitely. Xerxes watched the battle from his golden throne atop a nearby hill. He became so enraged at the defeat of his soldiers, he jumped up from his seat and screamed in anger. This was unbecoming for a ruler who was seen as a god by his followers. Leonidas and his 300 Spartan warriors and the other Greek soldiers had done the impossible. They'd stopped the Persian war machine in its tracks. During the second day of the Battle of Thermopylae, a local Greek shepherd by the name of Ephialtes asked for an audience with Xerxes. He told the guards he had information that would allow the Persians to defeat the Spartans. At this point, Xerxes had lost all patience. It seemed that the wall of Greek soldiers would not be broken. He was ready to try anything. Ephialtes eventually got his meeting with Xerxes and in exchange for a huge sum of money, he told the Persian emperor of the Anopaia Path that went through the mountains and ended up behind the Greek defensive line. Xerxes dispatched his immortals to encircle Leonidas and his forces. By cover of night, they left the Persian camp and traveled through the mountains. When the immortals reached the 1,000 Phocians Leonidas had ordered to guard the mountain pass, they quickly defeated them. Some accounts say the Phocians didn't even put up a fight but ran away in fear as they spotted the enemy soldiers. Either way, the Persians were coming. Luckily, word reached Leonidas before the enemy forces did. The Spartan king ordered his men and the rest of the Greek forces to retreat further south to make their final stand. But before the battle would take place, Leonidas did something that would secure his name in the history books forever. Leonidas decided that all of the Greek soldiers could leave the battle and return home to fight another day. However, he and his 300 Spartans would stay and hold off the Persians as long as possible, taking as many with them before they were killed. Along with the Spartans, a group of Thebans would also stay and fight, but the remaining soldiers were to be sent back to their cities to tell the tale of Leonidas and the 300 Spartans who defied a Persian king and slaughtered thousands of his men. It would seem that Leonidas would indeed fulfill the prophecy of the oracle. As the sun rose on the third day of the Battle of Thermopylae, Leonidas gathered his men. They all knew what was to come, and they were happy to die for their king and for Sparta. Leonidas looked at each of them in turn before the day got underway, at which point he said, Have a hearty breakfast, for tonight we dine in Hades. Later that night, the immortals arrived from the mountain pass, and a huge force of Persian soldiers advanced through the hot gates toward the Spartans. There are two different accounts of what happened next in the epic tale of Leonidas and his 300 warriors. Ephorus and Diodorus Siculus say that like a dangerous beast trapped in a corner, Leonidas decided to do something unpredictable and attack first. In this scenario, the Spartans charged into the Persian camp and slaughtered a large number of soldiers before being pushed back. The other account by Herodotus states that the Persians struck first, but not before Xerxes presented an offering to the gods for his generals before launching the final attack that would wipe out the Spartans. Either way, the outcome of what came next was the same. Leonidas and his men repositioned themselves in an open area where they'd be able to move around better and kill as many Persian soldiers as possible. As the immortals closed in on one side and the rest of Xerxes' forces moved in on the other, the Spartans began fighting in a frenzied manner. They did not forget their training, but used every method at their disposal to rip through the Persians. As their spears broke off inside of enemy soldiers and their shields shattered from slamming into the bodies of the immortals, the Spartans drew their swords and began to slash their way through the Persian ranks. It was a bloodbath, but there were just too many Persians. Less than 300 Spartans and a handful of other Greek soldiers remained against the might of the entire Persian army. Xerxes still had tens of thousands of soldiers at his disposal, while there was no hope for reinforcements or relief from the Greeks. During the carnage, Leonidas fell. His men surrounded their king and fought off the hordes of enemy soldiers. They managed to grab Leonidas and pull his body to safety until he passed away from the wounds. At the time of the Battle of Thermopylae, Leonidas was somewhere between 50 and 60 years old. He was by no means a young man, but Spartan warriors started their training as teenagers and would serve in the military until their 60s, so it's not surprising that Leonidas was still fighting at this age. The fact that he killed so many enemies while also commanding a Greek troop at the Battle of Thermopylae makes him one of the most respected warriors of all time. 
Even after Leonidas fell, the Spartans that remained continued to fight. They had fallen back to higher ground and used a protective wall to slow the onslaught of enemy troops. Many of them had lost their sword, shields, and spears, so they fought with their bare hands. An unarmed Spartan warrior was still a deadly adversary. The Persians knew this, and even after breaking down the Spartan protective wall and seeing that many of them were unarmed, they did not advance. The Persian soldiers could see in the eyes of the Spartans that if they got too close, they would very likely lose their lives, so the Persians took the easy way out. Rather than trying to defeat the Spartans in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they used bows and arrows to kill the remaining warriors. This may seem like a cowardly thing to do, but after witnessing how much damage and death the Spartans had caused over the last three days, they probably wanted to stay as far away from them as possible. A barrage of arrows was fired into the remaining Spartans, killing them all. Now that the defiant Spartans had been defeated, Xerxes could move freely across the battlefield without fear of being killed. He did not fight alongside his soldiers like Leonidas did. Once the Battle of Thermopylae ended, Xerxes had Leonidas' head cut off and his body impaled on a stake. After Xerxes and his forces moved on, Greek citizens recovered the bodies of the dead soldiers, including Leonidas, and buried them at Thermopylae. After the Persian War ended, a stone monument in the shape of a lion was erected on the spot where the 300 Spartans were buried. On it, the words, Go tell the Spartans, thou that passest by, that here obedient to their words we lie, were written by the poet Simonides. Basically, he was saying that the 300 Spartans who said they would fight to the death to slow the advance of the Persian army were true to their word. Now, to be fair, several Spartan soldiers died in the battle before the final stand. Also, King Leonidas allowed two Spartans, who were ill, to return home instead of forcing them to fight in the final battle. One refused to leave and was killed with the rest, while the other, a man named Aristotemis, did return home to Sparta. However, once he reached the city, he instantly regretted his decision. From the moment Aristotemis stepped foot in Sparta, he was shunned by everyone in the city. The fact that he had abandoned his duty and left his king to die on the battlefield was unforgivable. Aristotemis was stripped of his civic rights and had to carry his disgrace as a coward for the rest of his life. Luckily for Aristotemis, that wouldn't be very long. The next year, he joined a campaign to fight the Persians once again at the Battle of Plataea. It was said Aristotemis fought like a madman as he wanted to make up for his shameful decision to leave the Battle of Thermopylae. He ran to the front lines in a rage-filled fury and slashed apart the Persian ranks until he was finally brought down and killed. There is no doubt that Leonidas, his 300 Spartans, and other Greek soldiers who fought the Battle of Thermopylae slowed down the Persian advance through Greece. But there was a much more important effect that the battle had on the Greek populace. After the story of the 300 spread across the lands of Greece, more and more people felt it was their duty to fight. This was a matter of pride for many, and a way to avenge the deaths of the 300 Spartans who had fallen at the Battle of Thermopylae. It was also clear at this point that the Persians were coming for everyone, and all men who could fight needed to do so. The Spartans stopped the Persian forces at the hot gates for several days and did significant damage to their ranks and morale. The Persian soldiers who fought against Leonidas and his 300 Spartans would not soon forget how vicious and deadly they were. As Xerxes' armies marched into Greece, they were met by an even larger Spartan force, which must have been incredibly intimidating. The victories at Salamis and Plataea led to the Greeks finally defeating the invading Persian force and pushing them out of their borders. The sacrifice made by the men at the Battle of Thermopylae was definitely a call to arms for many Greeks. Without it, the Persians may very well have conquered the rest of Greece and enveloped it into their empire. Around 440 BCE, decades after the Persian Wars were over, the bones of Leonidas were dug up and brought back to Sparta. His tomb still exists where the modern city of Sparta is today. Now watch Most Hardcore Soldier Spartan or check out One Navy SEAL versus the Spartan 300. Who actually would win?